Fear the Walking Dead Season 6 is coming on strong with the plot rising again, Morgan is on the brink of death, will he be able to escape? And how will his feud with Virginia end? One night, Emil, in the jungle, is about to enjoy his dinner when a mysterious sound emanates from the woods. Alert. Emil loudly inquires who's there. Suddenly, a man invades his territory, tripping over a rope and falling to the ground. The man pleads for help, claiming something is chasing him. Emil says it looks like you got rid of them. What's your name? You hungry, Walter? Emil, upon hearing his name, does a complete turnaround in attitude, inviting him to join for dinner and promising to keep an eye on whatever is pursuing him. As Emil approaches Walter, the latter instinctively hides a key in his clothing, praising Emil's culinary skills. Just then, a dog's bark makes Walter tense. A big dog came in, and the dog was very tame in front of Emil. Walter claims the dog has been chasing him, but Emil, ignoring him, compliments the dog instead. Walter is shocked to realize the dog belongs to Emil. Before Walter can react, an axe nears his neck, and in moments, his head is severed. It all happens so fast. From life to death in just a few seconds, the transformation in Emil's demeanor from affable to ruthless is swift. He picks up the key, Walter and this key were his mission all along. Emil places Walter's head, now a zombie, in a prepared box, sealing it with a lid marked with Walter's name. Emil, a post-apocalyptic bounty hunter, was tasked with killing Walter and retrieving the key for his employer. Then, his walkie-talkie crackles to life. Emil asks who it is. It will have to wait. I have a delivery to make him Galveston. A voice replies, introducing herself as Virginia, with a lucrative job offer. Emil expresses interest upon hearing Virginia's promise of ample gasoline as a reward. When asked if Morgan was dead or alive, Virginia admits she doesn't know, instructing Emil to bring Morgan's head to her. Emil prepares another box labeled Morgan Jones and sets off. Where is Morgan at the moment and how did he escape the zombies in the town? At this moment, Morgan woke up. Unlike before, Morgan's eyes are bloodshot, his hair is longer than before, and he looks unkempt. There was another zombie passing by outside, and Morgan didn't alert it. Suddenly, a gunshot shatters the quiet, killing the zombie and breaking the car window. Morgan quickly lay down in the seat, careful not to make a sound. Several horseback riders passed by the car without noticing Morgan hiding inside. It had been over a month since the events in the small town unfolded. Without a doubt, the riders were Virginia's people, and Morgan knew he would be in grave danger if discovered by them. Pushing the car door open, Morgan emerged. His chest wound had worsened significantly, hindering his movement. The bullet was still lodged inside. His body emitted a scent of death so potent that even the zombies mistook him for one of their own. However, Morgan couldn't bear their indifference. In agony, he made a sound. The zombies turned and approached Morgan, wielding a stick. Morgan struggled to launch an attack, finally killing the zombie after three laborious strikes. The strenuous exercise made his wounds worse again. Morgan ventured out daily in search of supplies. Currently, he took shelter in a water tower. At the brink of death in the town, he had heard a gunshot at the last moment. Upon waking, Morgan found himself in this water tower, unaware of who had saved him. Now somewhat aimless, Morgan didn't attend much to his wound. Almost resigned to the idea that death might be a preferable outcome, he stored the supplies he gathered daily, hoping to repay the person who had saved him. The next day, Morgan continued his search for resources. In an abandoned police car, he discovered a handgun, an unexpected find. Although it was devoid of bullets, behind the glass, he saw baby supplies, which reminded him of Grace. Zombies quietly approached from behind. Morgan is about to grab his bags and leave the house when he falls to the ground. The pain from his wounds causing him to scream. The zombies had already reached him. Just as Morgan prepared to face his fate, the zombies turned away, repelled by his even stronger scent of death. At that moment, a man wielding a short knife appeared, killing the zombies. He hadn't noticed Morgan and mistook him for a zombie until Morgan spoke up. Narrowly avoiding a tragic misunderstanding, the man was puzzled. Why would zombies treat Morgan as one of their own? Attracted by the noise, more zombies gathered outside, forcing the two men to take refuge inside a store. Isaac asked Morgan how long he had been injured. Morgan estimated it to be five or six weeks old, now emitting a rotten smell, which explained why the zombies didn't attack him. Isaac, a former military medic, offered to examine Morgan's wound. However, Morgan refused. Morgan expressed that the person who had injured him was still searching for him, and he didn't want Isaac to get involved. Knowing well what his own fate might be, Isaac, 
Undeterred by Morgan's refusal, still offered him some snacks. Morgan's mood softened, recognizing that Isaac meant no harm, yet he declined Isaac's offer of assistance. Morgan preferred to face his destiny alone. Just then, they heard some noise outside. A dog appeared at the door. Both men instantly became alert. It was Emil, the bounty hunter. The zombies outside have been lying on the glass door too. So it's obvious there's someone inside. Who's in there? Mr. Jones? Emil called out. Suspecting Morgan's presence, Isaac guessed that the man was after Morgan. Attracted by Emil's voice, the zombies outside started moving towards him. With a single swing of his axe, Emil decapitated a zombie. Seeing Emil's ferocious appearance, I am afraid that he is not a good person. If Morgan is found, he will be in a bad situation. Isaac decided to take action to save Morgan, stepping outside to confront Emil. Look, buddy, I don't want any trouble, he said, hoping to mislead Emil into thinking the building was empty. Emil pulled out a portrait of Morgan and began to compare it, then asked Isaac if he had seen the man in the picture. Isaac denied ever seeing him. Emil, evidently experienced and imposing, made Isaac nervous. The dog barked loudly at the door, are you sure there's no one inside? Emil pressed. Isaac firmly replied no, but his sweaty face betrayed his anxiety. Emil decided he had to check the building himself. By the time they entered, Morgan had disappeared. However, the dog quickly found a scarf with Morgan's blood on it. Isaac explained, I found the scarf here when I arrived. Maybe he's been eaten by zombies. Emil, suspicious, swung his axe at a nearby closet. Isaac, drenched in cold sweat, was relieved Morgan wasn't inside. After an unsuccessful search, Emil and his dog left. Isaac rushed to the back door. He was afraid of Morgan's accident. He quickly used his short knife to kill a few zombies. By then, Morgan had collapsed nearby. When Morgan regained consciousness, he was back in the water tower. Isaac was treating his wound, trying to remove the bullet. Morgan, agitated, refused any help, preferring to be left alone. Morgan was puzzled about how Isaac knew this place. I saw your map in the backpack and guessed you lived here. Isaac explained. Morgan asked why Isaac was helping him. Isaac shared that his wife was eight months pregnant and showing signs of early labor. She needs a lot of oxygen if she delivers prematurely. When I went looking for oxygen, zombies surrounded our place. There were too many of them. I was looking for a gun to clear them out when I met you, but guns and ammo are hard to find now. Do you have any bullets? Morgan inquired. Isaac pulled out a few bullets from his pocket. Morgan took out the handgun he had found and handed it to Isaac, urging him to leave quickly, but there are only two bullets, and firing the gun will attract more zombies. Isaac reasoned, still hoping Morgan would help. Zombies won't attack you now. You could easily pass through them and bring oxygen to my wife. He pleaded. I can't help you. Morgan responded. Sure you can, Morgan. Lifting his head, Morgan then picked up his weapon and confronted Isaac. I never told you my name. How do you know it? I saw your video at a truck stop. I wasn't sure it was you when I first met you, but now I'm certain. Isaac replied. Before Isaac could finish, Morgan refused to help and asked him to keep his distance. I'm not willing to do those things anymore. I need you to stay away from me. Isaac had no choice for his wife. He said I'm sorry I don't have the time I had to do it this way. Just then, the water tower began to shake violently. It turned out that Emil had found them and was using a vehicle's tow rope to pull down the tower. Slowly, the tower crashed towards the ground. Morgan woke up again and was met by Emil, who was holding an axe. Luckily, the mattress inside the tower cushioned his fall, leaving him unharmed. Meanwhile, Isaac was busy fending off zombies attracted by the commotion. Seeing Isaac, the man who had deceived him, Emil was furious. Morgan, inside the tower, made noise to attract zombies and hinder Emil's approach. But Emil's combat prowess was formidable. A few zombies were no match for him. As Emil neared, Morgan finally reached the handgun and aimed it at Emil. Unfazed, Emil taunted, you're too injured to last much longer. Isaac yelled at Morgan to shoot. Morgan hesitated, conflicted, the old him would never have killed. But now he shot Emil in the arm. Isaac quickly pulled Morgan away to escape. Emil, delayed by a few more zombies, couldn't catch up. Eventually, the two men got in Isaac's car and drove off. Minutes later, they encountered a roadblock and were forced to leave the car and detour. I need to go back to the water tower. He should be gone by now. Morgan insisted. Isaac couldn't understand Morgan's fixation. That tower is the only reason I've survived. 
Morgan explained, despite Isaac's warning that the tower was no longer safe and the dog would track him, Morgan was undeterred. That tower wasn't built just for me. Morgan continued, I don't know who stitched my wound. I was about to be devoured by zombies when I heard a gunshot. The zombies turned to go and I passed out. When I woke up, I was in the tower, wound stitched. There was a note saying, you don't know me, but I heard you on the walkie-talkie. You need to live and continue your unfinished business. Isaac said that I don't care who you've got those supplies for. It's to protect them, but now that place is compromised. Where I'm staying is safe. Help my family, and I'll help those people. Moved by Isaac's words, Morgan agreed to go with him to his wife's location. On the way, they talked about Morgan's former team, which Isaac knew from documentaries. Virginia split you up, right? Isaac asked. Morgan tensed, realizing the documentary never mentioned Virginia. You know my name and about Virginia, are you taking me to her? Morgan accused. Isaac confessed. I used to be one of Virginia's writers but I escaped. I didn't tell you because I was afraid you wouldn't trust me. Morgan was a little more relaxed. Isaac continued. I've seen your documentaries. In Virginia's world, you exchange freedom for necessities. But you were helping people for free. I thought that was impossible. But after learning of my wife's pregnancy, I saw the future Virginia was building. I didn't want my child born into a world without freedom. What you're doing is much better. You're trying. That's why my wife and I chose to run away. Morgan was visibly moved. Isaac suggested, the place I'm staying is secure. You can turn it into a natural sanctuary, but you need to let me remove that bullet. Morgan simply said that it was too late now and that he had given up on himself. Soon, they arrived at Isaac's sanctuary. The tall walls kept out the zombies. Who roamed outside? The entrance was narrow, making it a natural haven. Please, take these to my wife. Isaac requested, it's safe here, even if Virginia finds it. Just fortify the entrance and she can't get in. I'll enter through another way. It might take a couple of days, but I hope to get there before my child is born. Without delay, Morgan handed the gun to Isaac and walked towards the horde of zombies. The man limped toward the zombies, betting they wouldn't attack him due to the rotting scent of his wounds. As he expected, the zombies mistook Morgan for one of their own, and he passed through them without issue as long as he kept quiet. After the first wave of zombies had passed, Morgan stopped in his tracks. The gunshot wound in his chest made him unable to hold on and he fell to the ground. But Morgan, hardened by trials, wasn't going to be stopped by mere pain. He struggled to his feet, but the pain he felt as he struggled to get up caused him to scream, which immediately attracted a zombie to come close to him. Just as the zombie was about to bite Morgan, a gunshot rang out. Isaac had shot the last bullet. Saving Morgan, Morgan forced himself up. Isaac told him, I'll draw the zombies away. You go inside. Morgan glanced at the nearby entrance, but like always, he wouldn't let a teammate be in danger, making noise. He drew the zombies toward himself. Soon, the zombies turned toward Morgan. Prepared for battle, Morgan decided it was better to fight than to hide. Isaac understood his intent and joined the fight. Despite his injury, Morgan's prowess with a stick remained formidable. Simple thrusts and jabs were enough to fend off the zombies. His wound ached, but he endured. After half an hour of fighting, they had cleared the area of zombies. Isaac led Morgan to the entrance, crossing into the secluded sanctuary. It seemed an ideal place for survivors to live. Isaac quickly made his way to the house. Thankfully his wife was okay. And of course he introduced Morgan to Rachel. Isaac learned about Rachel's symptoms and now that he had oxygen he could deliver her at any time. That night, they talked outside. Isaac shared how he found this place while fishing with his grandfather. The dam served as a protective barrier. The area had water and fertile soil. Morgan, you could rebuild here, he suggested. But Morgan continued to refuse, blaming himself for his team's past misfortunes. Suddenly, they heard noises outside, likely Emil finding the place. Morgan instructed them to stay inside, as Emil was only after him. But Isaac insisted, you saved my family. I can't let you face death alone, Morgan urged. Keep your promise, find my people, bring them here, take care of your family. Morgan stepped outside alone. Sure enough, Emil had found the place, facing his possible end. Morgan said, I'm no match for you now, and I know Virginia sent you, I won't resist, just spare the people here. Emil agreed. Morgan dropped his weapon, knelt, and raised his hands in surrender, waiting for Emil to take his head. He closed his eyes, but then fighting sounds erupted. Isaac had been thrown to the ground by Emil. As Emil prepared to kill Isaac, 
Morgan couldn't just watch. What followed was a masterful display of stick fighting for Morgan. Even injured, Morgan was a formidable opponent for Emil. In Rick's group, Morgan's combat skills were unparalleled. Even with cold weapons, but the intense fight was too much for Morgan. Training his strength. You can't die. Morgan, this place needs you to complete its construction. I can't take care of your people for you. Isaac said. He then lifted his shirt to reveal a zombie bite on his waist. Morgan felt a wave of sadness. I was bitten the first time I came back. Before I went looking for the guns, it doesn't matter if I return or not. The important thing was bringing you back. Saying I'd take a detour was just a lie. Isaac confessed. As they spoke, Emil charged and knocked Isaac to the ground again. Knowing Morgan's skill, Emil became cautious, exerting full force with each axe swing. Despite his caution, Morgan's stick hit Emil in the abdomen. In the midst of attacking, Emil pressed on Morgan's wound, causing him excruciating pain and leaving him powerless. Emil turned to grab his axe. Morgan, remembering the stranger's note left for him, knew he couldn't give up. As Emil swung the axe down, Morgan, with one hand, blocked the attack with his stick, surprising even Emil. Emil increased his strength, and Morgan resisted fiercely despite his injury. Eventually, the axe slid down the stick and fell aside. Morgan's stick broke again, but it didn't stop him from retaliating. He knew he had to make a change. The stick piercing through Emil marked the beginning of Morgan's transformation. Then, picking up the axe, Morgan faced Emil. Emil, sure Morgan couldn't bring himself to kill, underestimated him, but he was wrong. <laughs> Exhausted, Morgan went to the steps and told Isaac, I figured out that I'm going to keep them alive. You should see your wife. I'll rest here for a while. The next day, Morgan woke up to the dog licking his face. His wound had been treated, and the bullet removed. Sitting inside was Isaac's wife, Rachel, with a newborn. Morgan looked at the newborn and asked if she was a boy or a girl. He's a big fan of children. Rachel answered, It's a girl. I named her Morgan. Morgan can't believe it. Rachel explained it was Isaac's idea. When Morgan asked about Isaac, Rachel's face filled with sadness. And Morgan understood. He then went to where Emil had died. Besides the zombified head, there was a key in a pool of blood. The object hanging from Emil's neck must have been important. Suddenly, a zombie approached. Morgan drew his weapon, but then he saw Emil's axe and swapped the stick for it. From that day on, the compassionate Morgan was gone. He had to shoulder the responsibility and change his ways. Unrestrained kindness wouldn't achieve great things. An armored truck drove down the road, blocked by zombies. The men check that there is no danger, and the boss, Virginia, walks out slowly. Virginia smiled at the squirming box labeled with Morgan's name, and she assumed that Emil had done his job. But her smile froze upon seeing Emil's head inside. Visibly scared, Virginia spoke into the walkie-talkie. If you're listening, I thought my plans could only start with your death. But I don't need that now. I won't trouble you anymore. But you have to make your former teammates believe you're dead, or I'll make them join the ranks of the zombies. With that, Virginia turned to leave. Morgan Jones is dead, and you were dealing with somebody else now. The cold words sent chills down her spine. Meanwhile, Morgan, now clad in Emil's attire, watched them from a distance. The road ahead was destined to be tumultuous and bloody. The fear of becoming a prisoner in a post-apocalyptic world was palpable. The guards distributed weapons to the prisoners, some of whom trembled with fear. As they knocked on the rolling door, a fierce response from zombies inside echoed back. Their task was to clear out the zombies behind the door. Prisoner number 41, terrified, turned to run away. He was naturally timid and had never killed a zombie before. Hearing the guard cocking his gun, he knew he had no choice but to tremblingly pick up his weapon again. The guards reminded them to aim for the zombies' heads and to avoid close contact at all costs. Under the man's command, they advanced cautiously, unsure if they would survive. One prisoner was responsible for the rolling door's mechanism. When the door opened, a syrup-like liquid first appeared. Even prepared, the sight of so many zombies' feet unnerved them. But at that moment, the door was stuck. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't pull it open. Soon, zombies crawled out from underneath. 
The guards hurriedly ordered them to push the zombies back and close the door again, but it was too late. The prisoner handling the door was grabbed by a zombie. Several people with weapons also rushed forward to participate in killing zombies. Inexperienced people were directly dragged in by zombies. Number 41, paralyzed with fear, stood frozen, seeing him petrified. The guard went to lower the door himself, only to be grabbed by a woman who had just been dragged in. She screamed for help. The man, devoid of emotion, pulled out his pistol and ended her suffering, but then, his own foot was grabbed, and he was dragged in too. As the door finally started to close, the floor was too slippery for him to find a foothold, and he screamed in terror. 41 didn't choose to stand by and watch this time. He tried to pull the man out, but the man pleaded with 41 to kill him. The man didn't even manage to kill himself. Ironically, the one who survived was the most cowardly. Number 41, this was one of the cruelest scenes in Virginia's community. Meanwhile, Victor and Alicia, who had also arrived at the community, were faring no better, they were relegated to the lowest tier. Assigned to clean latrines, an armored truck approached from a distance and stopped in front of them. The driver, a rider named Marcus, intentionally troubled Victor and Alicia. In this community, riders held a high status and could not be offended, but the defiant Victor didn't care. He not only spouted insults but also dumped a bucket of waste near Marcus's feet. Marcus pointed his gun directly at Victor. Luckily, a girl resembling Virginia intervened, defusing the situation and speaking up for Alicia and Victor. However, their act of provoking a rider was a severe offense, leading them to be brought before Virginia for judgment. Alicia, handcuffed, saw the girl from earlier and thanked her for speaking up for them. The girl, bright and seemingly fond of Alicia and Victor, introduced herself as Dakota. In another room, Virginia was giving orders while getting her hair trimmed. She commanded her subordinates to dispatch a group of riders westward to find Morgan. Daniel was diligently trimming Virginia's hair, showing no reaction to her orders. When Victor and Alicia entered, they were stunned to see Daniel there. Despite Victor's calls, Daniel just focused on cutting hair. Sitting down, Alicia, ignoring Virginia, asked Daniel if he was okay. But Daniel says, have I ever cut your hair before? Daniel, forgetting Alicia, said he didn't want to cause trouble, which wasn't like the Daniel they knew. Virginia explained that they hadn't done anything wrong. Daniel had just had a conflict over his cat, observing Daniel's head wound. It seemed he might indeed have amnesia. Without his haircutting skills, he probably would have been killed. Virginia then blamed Victor for disrespecting a rider in broad daylight, necessitating punishment. She took out Alicia's weapon and said she would send them to a place where they could be useful. After Virginia left with her man, Victor, assured they were alone, urged Daniel to stop pretending. Victor knew Daniel's tough character and couldn't believe he would willingly cut hair for an enemy, but Daniel still said, I don't know what you're talking about, it looks like Daniel really lost his memory. Soon, Victor and Alicia were transported away from the community in an armored vehicle, ending up at a dock where many zombies were contained. Seeing the door's agitation, they realized their assigned task. Alicia asked what was inside, and Hill replied that they'd find out once they cleaned it up. Virginia was creating a future, and whatever was inside was key to its completion. Hill warned that anyone attempting to escape would be shot on sight. These were all people who had disobeyed in the community. Victor questioned why they didn't just use the armored vehicle to quickly clear the area. Hill explained that Virginia didn't want to damage what was inside and hoped to find them alive on his return. Unexpectedly, they encountered Charlie, who revealed they had been sent there after two failed escape attempts. Janice also appeared, another troublemaker. The reunion of familiar faces brought some comfort as they could trust their former teammates. Victor learned from Janice about the situation, nine riders overseeing, and only a few prisoners trustworthy. Victor suggested they not clear the zombies but eliminate all the riders and escape. He was tired of cleaning latrines. Of course, this was just a thought. Victor still had to change into work clothes and continue with menial tasks. The higher-ups said Alicia and Victor had made a mistake and were sent to the docks where they were tasked with killing the zombies behind the roll-up door. Soon, the cavalry arrived with new weapons for them. Looking at the spears, Victor's thoughts weren't on killing zombies, but on leading a revolt against the cavalry and escaping. Alicia pointed out the impossibility of their plan. As their enemies were armed with guns, Victor argued that they were outnumbered and could be quickly overpowered. In Alicia's eyes, Victor had never been one to take the lead. Victor explained that they had always been following others' orders, and now it was time to take control of their own destiny. Just then, Charlie discovered something inside. 
They entered to find Dakota hiding in a vehicle. Dakota explained that her eavesdropping was unintentional, but she needed to escape. She offered to help them overthrow Virginia, revealing that Virginia was her sister. This revelation confused them even more. Victor took Dakota to a secluded spot to talk. Dakota said you're not the first to try and fight back, but if you kill the cavalry, Virginia won't let you go. Virginia will kill your friends and family if she doesn't find you. She needed their help to escape Virginia's influence. Alicia said what makes you think we can help you? Dakota mentions a documentary they left behind that shows what they are capable of. Even though they are not in a good place right now, the cavalry had guns, but there was a crucial weapon behind the roller door that could change everything. Dakota didn't know what it was, but it was vital enough for her sister to send people to their deaths for it. On other matters, Dakota admitted her ignorance. Only knowing the weapon could help gain the future Virginia sought. If they get the weapon, they can overthrow Virginia. Victor couldn't understand why Dakota would oppose her own sister. Dakota revealed her intimate knowledge of Virginia's cruel deeds and even Victor's secret dealings with her. Shocked to learn Victor had kept things from her, Alicia stormed out. Victor followed, explaining his only condition for fixing the armored vehicle was to be paired with her. Alicia said she didn't need his protection. Victor confessed he wanted to be with her for his own reasons, emphasizing her as his most trusted ally for any internal sabotage. Touched by his confession, Alicia let go of her grudges. However, she insisted they couldn't risk others' lives on a reckless venture, they would decide their next move after killing the zombies and securing the weapon. Reluctantly, Victor agreed to this approach. They were soon called to fight the zombies. This time they listened to Janice's advice and used this method of controlling the zombies by herding livestock from the farm. As long as they coordinated properly they could even achieve zero deaths. Even the timid Sunjay joined Victor's team, eager to prove himself and earn his way back into the community. Once everything was set up, all it took was a command from Victor, and Sanjay would open the main gate. Victor now showed a semblance of leadership. He quickly left the passage and, like the other prisoners, picked up a spear, ready for the zombie's emergence. Now! At Victor's signal, Sanjay opened the roller door holding back the zombies, immediately revealing the scene behind it. Victor and the other prisoners banged on the rails to attract the zombies. Knowing they could only eliminate them one by one at the door, the timid Sanjay couldn't bear to look even for a moment. Under Victor's direction, they calmly waited for the zombies to approach. Working in pairs, they efficiently took down the zombies and quickly dragged the bodies away to prevent blockages. Those at the back took turns, making the elimination of the zombies only a matter of time. After a few minutes, the corpses of the zombies had piled up into a small hill. However, they had clearly underestimated the number of zombies behind the door. As the barrier began to shake, at the exit of the passageway, they also encountered trouble. One zombie fell down at the exit of the passageway, followed by other zombies tripping and falling. Victor urgently instructed Sanjay to close the roller door, but Sanjay, paralyzed by fear, had already disappeared, as the barrier was about to collapse. Victor quickly ordered Janice to hold it while Charlie tried to close the door. Janice and a few other prisoners managed to hold the barrier, albeit barely, but as Charlie tried to close the door, it got blocked by the bodies of the zombies. In her attempt to move them, a zombie suddenly grabbed her hair. Charlie screamed for Alicia to save her. Victor and Alicia immediately sprang into action. Alicia killed the nearest zombie from the front, while Victor provided support from above. Just as Alicia was about to pull Charlie out, her hair got tangled in the hands of a zombie, followed by another attack from behind. Charlie closed her eyes in fear, but luckily Dakota arrived just in time to kill the attacking zombie. Alicia quickly pulled up Charlie and shut the iron door, then anxiously asked if she was hurt. Charlie assured her that she was fine. As Dakota and Charlie were talking, two cavalrymen burst in, their mission being to find Dakota. Thinking Victor and his group meant harm to Dakota, one of the men immediately reported to Virginia that they had found her sister. Virginia said she would arrive soon. The two troopers treated Victor and the others as thugs and shouted at them to put down their weapons. And then the men were about to take Dakota by force. At this moment, Janice exclaimed that they couldn't hold back the zombies any longer. They were about to break through. Victor realized they needed to quickly clear up the zombies and retrieve the weapon inside. He told Janice to retreat and arm themselves to eliminate all the zombies. Without their resistance, the barrier was directly breached by the zombies. The zombies came out with nothing but blood and flesh in their eyes and headed towards the crowd. The two cavalrymen were forced to defend this breach temporarily. Victor again led the group in frontally attacking the zombies, methodically proceeding as before. Dakota struggled desperately, 
Not wanting to be imprisoned again, facing the zombies, Dakota quickly ran to the lower part of the tunnel. The cavalrymen hurried to kill the nearest zombies and tried to recapture Dakota, but one of the men, in his attempt to pull Dakota out, was directly knocked down and devoured by two zombies. Victor rushed to assist Dakota. The woman's attention was distracted and was also dragged by the zombies behind her. With too many zombies to handle, they could only temporarily block them with a plank. Alicia and the others were trapped inside. While Victor and Dakota were at another door, Alicia shouted to Victor that they needed guns, but the cavalryman's weapons were surrounded by zombies. So Victor led Dakota into the RV. There, they found the frightened Sanjay, who was too scared to speak. Victor thought of a plan and honked the RV's horn, trying to attract the zombies to their location. Victor asked if the zombies had been drawn away, and Sanjay peeked out to see the zombies still encircling the warehouse. Victor pressed the horn desperately, but the horde of zombies remained unmoved. Sanjay said it was useless, obviously fresh flesh was more attractive. Victor had an idea. He took the dagger from Sanjay's hand, telling him to follow and instructed Dakota to stay inside the vehicle. Sanjay questioned if Victor understood the trouble of getting involved with Virginia's sister. Victor argued that if they had eliminated the cavalrymen earlier, they could have been far away by now. But to save Alicia and the others, there was only one way. Be a hero. Sanjay didn't think Victor would do that. Victor proclaimed it was Sanjay's day to become a hero, then pushed him forward, shouting. Victor kicks Sanjay into the zombie horde, smelling the blood. The zombies finally left the warehouse. Janice and Alicia were relieved of the pressure and found the weapons of the two cavalrymen. Victor coldly watched Sanjay being torn apart by zombies. Revealing his true nature, it was only the presence of good people around him that had masked this side of Victor. Alicia and Janice cleared the remaining zombies with their rifles, and soon the courtyard was filled with zombie corpses. Victor remarked solemnly, We did it! They also found Sanjay's body. Victor solemnly claimed he tried to prevent Sanjay's sacrifice, but he chose to save them, dying for their cause. Just then, Virginia's voice came over the radio, unaware of what had happened saying she would arrive in 10 minutes. There's no time. They have to find the weapon before Virginia gets here. But despite searching the entire warehouse, there was no sign of the weapon. Dakota insisted she had told the truth. Now they're running out of time to get away. Soon, Virginia and her group arrived. Victor and the others realized the situation was grim. Virginia was relieved to see her sister unharmed, showing no concern for her fallen men. Dakota reluctantly rejoined Virginia's side. Victor stepped forward saying they acted under his command and if anyone should be punished, it should be him. Virginia, far from angry, was actually pleased. She said Victor had accomplished what others couldn't, clearing the area. Alicia asks what the hell that means. There are no weapons here. Virginia revealed that what she wanted wasn't inside but in Victor, a true leader. Congratulations. Victor, you've just formed an army for us, she said. It turned out the zombies were Virginia's way of selecting talent. Virginia then gave Victor a badge symbolizing his status and told him it came with great power, but he and his team must be ready when she calls. Daniel also arrived with Virginia. He cleaned the syrup from Charlie's hair. Charlie asked if he really forgot everything, even the warehouse cat. She even played an instrument Daniel had taught her, hoping to jog his memory, but to no avail. Victor had the power now, but he didn't keep his acquaintances like Alicia around. He sent Alicia to a distant job and left Janice to wash clothes. They didn't understand but had no choice. Finally, Victor bid farewell to Alicia. He didn't explain his reasons, just asked her to never forget him, perhaps knowing he'd make choices they wouldn't want to see. Alicia left, and Victor faced his path alone, passing Daniel. Victor felt reflective. Daniel had once advised him to stay true to himself, but now Daniel seemed to have forgotten his past. Daniel and a cavalryman then prepared to return to the community by horse-drawn carriage. Not far out, Daniel suddenly said he forgot his scissors inside. The cavalryman, annoyed at the delay, offered to go back for them. With the man gone, Daniel leisurely got off the carriage, took out his dagger, and whistled. A responding whistle came from the darkness, and a zombie approached Daniel. As Daniel ready to strike, an axe suddenly cleaved the zombie's head. The newcomer, dressed in a trench coat and leather shoes, stood before Daniel. Thanks, friend, if you are one, Daniel said, relaxing his guard. You know I am, Daniel. And I could use your help. You need a haircut, brother, he added with a smile. The two exchanged smiles. Looking around to ensure they were alone, Daniel laughed. Good to see you, Morgan. I knew you were the one she was looking for. 
we have a daughter. We named her Morgan. In this post-apocalyptic world, newborns symbolize humanity's hope. Morgan gazed at the child, also named Morgan, with a fatherly smile. He had taken on the responsibility of caring for Isaac's wife, Rachel, bringing food to her every day. Rachel, looking at the food, couldn't imagine surviving the apocalypse without Morgan's help. All she could offer in return was her gratitude. A bit embarrassed, Morgan said he also brought some nutritional supplements and books for her. Rachel's expression changed when she saw one of the food items, recognizing it as something from Virginia's community. Morgan said I have someone on the inside. Don't worry and I'll do whatever it takes to get them out. Suddenly, Rachel asked if Morgan wanted to hold the baby. Morgan, deep inside longing to hold the little one, glanced at the knife in his hand, perhaps realizing he was no longer the same Morgan. Morgan again picked up his own broken long stick. His weapon may represent his current personality. Morgan was a tragic figure. The disaster had claimed his wife and child, twisting his character into someone fluctuating between saint and sinner. After encountering Isaac, Morgan saw his sacrifice for his family and child, inspiring him to reignite his resolve to find grace and bring his old friends to this safe haven. Though the journey would undoubtedly be hard, Morgan feared by the time he achieved this, he would be unrecognizable to them. Rachel reassured him that even if he had changed, he was still their leader. You're like the spliced axe. You're still you. Only your ways have changed. Elsewhere, Dwight and Althea arrived at a survivor community. After being taken by Virginia, they were doing the same thing as her team, convincing survivor communities to join. But this community had fallen to zombies. With no survivors, Dwight reported to the cavalry that 15 were dead, and no one had survived. But the orders from the other end of the radio were to scavenge for supplies and determine the cause of death to prevent a similar fate in their community. It was tough being ordered to do things they didn't like. They've been to a hundred of these sites, but they have no choice. They can't even run. If they lose contact, it's their friends who suffer. This was why Virginia kept them separated. To lighten their mood, Dwight found a pack of beer, and they discussed life. Just then, Althea's radio crackled with a woman's voice, saying, the weather's clear. We're heading to the drop point for fuel. Expecting to arrive in an hour. Althea was very nervous because it was her secret and she had been thinking about the woman called Isabel. She had finally found their internal communication channel and promised Isabel she wouldn't reveal her organization to anyone. Under Dwight's questioning, Althea revealed that the voice was her lover's. They frequently changed frequencies. And Althea had been tracking their conversations, guessing the location of their meeting point. Dwight said why don't you go over to her then? Althea says they have strict rules about not letting the outside world know they exist. Dwight, excitedly, encouraged Althea to seize the opportunity. To hell with the rules, he said. You can reach the helicopter landing site before it arrives and run away with her. Join her group, despite not finding his own wife. Dwight was genuinely happy for Althea and urged her to bravely meet her lover. If Althea found her, they planned to use a zombie of similar size to Althea to fool Virginia, claiming she died on a mission, motivated by Dwight. Althea decided to take the brave step. That night, they arrived at their destination, a high-rise building, the next landing site for the plane. The building was eerie, with the end as the beginning spray-painted on the walls. In the stairwell, they heard zombies behind a door. Althea opened it, and they efficiently dealt with three zombies. <laughs> behind the door, they found cages containing live rats, which added to the eeriness of the building. Suddenly, a zombie fell from above, but Dwight quickly dispatched it. Looking up, he heard more zombies above. It seemed they were in for a fight, but they weren't scared. They were seasoned survivors. After climbing three floors, they found a group of zombies blocked by furniture. They kicked open a nearby door to hide. As they closed the door, two people with guns confronted them. They were survivors, highly cautious. Althea explained they just wanted to reach the rooftop. Nora says you're in cahoots with the guy who flew the plane. Althea denied it. Nora goes on to say that if you think the people who landed on the roof are here to save you, you should think again, because the last person who went to the roof to see what was going on was killed. Once Nora understood they weren't associated with the helicopter, she softened her stance but questioned their filming. They were then locked in an office. Dwight and Althea disagreed on their next move. Dwight thought Althea's lover was just an ordinary person and didn't expect the danger on the rooftop. As they argued, the two earlier survivors returned. Having watched their footage and mistakenly thinking Althea and Dwight were filming to help other communities, they didn't know about Virginia's brutality. Nora returned the camera and asked for their help. She led them to a floor with several dying survivors. Dwight, influenced by Morgan, 
couldn't stand by and do nothing, he was about to give a man some water when Althea, looking nervous, urged Dwight to leave quickly. These people had been infected with a terrible plague in the apocalypse, weak and covered in boils on their necks. Dwight, undeterred, wanted to help them. Althea, however, was very nervous, urging Dwight to leave quickly. Dwight thought they should inform Virginia's team to come and treat these people. Althea said that if Virginia knew they were running around, they'd be the first to be killed. Besides, the symptoms on their necks were of a plague called the Black Death, which she had seen wipe out an entire village before they could get an antidote. Virginia would only come to kill these carriers of infection. Nora, meanwhile, felt powerless, having thought they found someone to save them. After exiting, Althea headed towards the rooftop, but Dwight stopped, asking, are we just going to let them die here? Althea didn't answer but instead broke open a fire hydrant, using the axe inside to block the door. Aware of the plague's dangers, they argued fiercely about their approach. Althea, determined to see her lover, headed to the rooftop, even at the risk of her life. Feeling Althea's determination, Dwight reluctantly agreed to accompany her, but they encountered many zombies on the stairs and had to hide in a room. With only two hours until the plane's arrival, Althea ran inside, spotting rats in a corner. She had an idea. The rats on the first floor had made it here. There must be natural gas pipelines in the walls. And sure enough, following the rat, they managed to find the wall. They could now climb up the pipe. They climbed all the way up to the top floor and tried to enter the room through the passage. In the passage, they encountered countless rats, possibly infected. They had no choice but to crawl forward, avoiding the rats as much as possible. They broke through the wooden wall to the top floor, only to find it overrun with zombies, likely infected by the plague. Killing the zombies risked their own infection, so they hid in the bathroom. That's when Althea noticed boils on Dwight's neck, he was infected. Dwight, resigned to his fate, didn't want Althea to feel guilty. Althea said the disease was treatable, but they needed to find medicine quickly. Dwight, having traversed much of the country, knew the pain of not finding a loved one. Your lover is right in front of you, how can you give up? He urged Althea. Just then, gunshots outside put them on high alert. It was Nora who apparently had her own way out. Nora demanded they contact their leader to get antibiotics to treat them. Dwight says she's not gonna help you, she'll probably just shoot us all. I've got petrol in my car, we can drive out and find it. Althea told her to go to the roof and do what she wanted. Nora agreed to this plan. The stairway to the rooftop was on the other side of the zombies. Dwight volunteered to kill them. Already being infected, they quickly removed the obstacles. but the oncoming zombies were overwhelming. Both women, regardless of infection risk, joined Dwight in fighting off the zombies. In just a few minutes, they cleared all the zombies and arrived at the stairway entrance. Althea urged Dwight to visit every pharmacy and not to give up. She felt guilty for Dwight's infection, which happened while helping her, and now she was planning to leave with her lover. Dwight sincerely wished Althea well, understanding her desire to see her lover. As Althea prepared to give Dwight the camera, he refused saying he left a message for her to watch later. Althea bid farewell, knowing this might be their last meeting. Upon reaching the rooftop, Althea found it was indeed a supply point for the organization, complete with fuel and signal flares. She waited for the helicopter, watching the sky, then opened the camera. Dwight had recorded a message during their journey, blessing her and her lover's future. Althea was silent even though she was about to meet her lover she didn't seem that happy. Then she made a decision. She took out a flare gun and fired it towards the sky. And then said on their channel, Ground 17, please turn your course. The voice she longed to hear responded. They all know it's each other but they don't dare to recognize each other. If the organization finds out they'll all die. Althea informed the helicopter that the area was overrun with zombies, possibly infected with the plague, and therefore unsafe. The voice on the other side finally asked if you were infected too. And Althea said I'm not sure. Their conversation was tinged with a cold tone, masking their mutual concern. The woman mentioned leaving beer in the supply pack for Althea. As Althea tearfully watched the helicopter depart, she opened the supply box and found beer, along with something else. She immediately contacted Dwight to stay put, telling him she was coming to him. Dwight said what happened and why did the helicopter leave again. Althea got excited and said, stay where you are. I'm coming to get you. Althea then headed downstairs. Inside the box was the equivalent of the antibiotic vaccine that saved everyone here. Even those who didn't have symptoms took the pills as a precaution. Dwight was confused about why Althea returned. Althea explained that she had lost a brother once, 
leaving behind only a videotape, and she did not want that to happen again. They all decided to leave the building, avoiding Virginia's community, which would be like walking into the lion's den. Upon reaching the ground floor, Althea scrutinized the cages, suspecting the plague might have been intentionally released, perhaps by the person who spray-painted the walls. A voice came over the radio, asking about the flare scene on the rooftop. Dwight froze for a second then grabbed the walkie-talkie out of Althea's hand and said, a little unsure. Honey, is that you? The silence on the other end filled Dwight with disappointment, fearing it was just a hallucination. Dwight? Dwight rushed outside in a frenzy, not excited but nervous that this was all another hallucination. When he came to the alley, he froze. She's right there, the woman he had longed for, his wife. You kept your beauty. Oh. Looking at his weeping wife he knew that this time he had found her. They embraced and kissed deeply. Althea came running out and was so happy for Dwight. No one understood Dwight's struggles to find his wife more than Morgan's team members. Joining Morgan's group, Dwight had truly become himself again, doing good deeds to atone for his past, hoping to proudly tell his wife about his actions when they finally met. Now, Dwight had achieved this. This is a community that is known as a warm harbor in a post-apocalyptic world, where the people living in it have no worries about food, clothing or the suffering of zombies attacking them. Everyone had assigned jobs but were not allowed to leave without permission. John, who had been there for six months, didn't mind the rules. He used to be a police officer, so Virginia assigned him the same role in the community. Weapon use was strictly controlled with daily reporting. Besides, John took turns on duty with a young man named Cameron. The days weren't luxurious, but John felt invested in the place and hopeful about its future. The only imperfection was that Naomi had been assigned to another subsidiary community. John secretly exchanged letters with Naomi through Janice, who handled laundry for all communities. Reading her letters was the highlight of John's day. But was this community as ideal as John thought? The next day, John went to his duty post but didn't find Cameron, accompanied by two cavalrymen. He went to Cameron's house, which was eerily silent. Eventually, John found Cameron outside, being devoured by two zombies. A gruesomely brutal scene, John hurriedly killed the zombies. Looking at Cameron turned into zombies. The former duty partner became like this John endured the pain to send him off for the last time. That night, as a police officer, he thought to secure the scene. He prevented others from moving Cameron's body to preserve evidence. Virginia arrived promptly, hearing of the incident. As the leader, Virginia should have investigated whether it was an accident or foul play. John didn't understand why Virginia merely expressed regret and advised everyone to disperse and sleep. She even ordered her men to remove John's protective measures. Virginia told John they couldn't create panic, suggesting Cameron was too close to the fence due to drunkenness. She instructed her men to dispose of the body, closing the case. John, still a policeman at heart, inspected the scene and found an earring. As John was about to return home, a car approached, and out stepped Victor, wearing a high-level badge. John was surprised, and Victor explained he had done some unavoidable things and was now part of the community's internal affairs committee. Summoned by Virginia for a meeting, after a brief exchange, they parted ways. The next day, John approached Janice to talk about Cameron. Janice's face noticeably tensed up. John showed her the earring he had found and asked if she recognized it. Janice denied ever seeing it. John was relieved to get Janice's denial. As long as it was not someone he was familiar with, he would have to investigate. He presented the earring to Virginia, expressing his suspicion about Cameron's death and his desire to investigate further. Virginia reluctantly agreed but advised him to keep it discreet. Soon after, the community organized a funeral for Cameron, which was conducted by Jacob, the pastor himself. At that moment, there was a shout from the distance. A man trying to escape was caught by the cavalry, and it was Janice who was trying to escape. In Virginia's eyes, Janice was already a repeat offender, so she asked her men to check her rucksack. Janice didn't say a word, just looked indignant. A search of her backpack revealed food, water, and an earring identical to the one from the crime scene. John was speechless, Janice was arrested, and John confronted her about lying. Janice remained silent, when John pressed her for the truth to help her. Janice responded that nothing she said would make a difference. She felt targeted by Virginia ever since she and her brother refused to conform, whether she did it or not. As long as Virginia thinks she did it, she's the scapegoat. 
John naively promised to prove her innocence, believing Virginia's actions were just for safety. Janice revealed the earring was planted by Virginia and shared her story. She and Cameron were lovers, secretly hoarding supplies to escape. But Cameron was murdered before their plan could materialize. Virginia summoned John for a talk, and he promptly went to her office. He tried to convince her there were still many details to check in Cameron's case. However, Virginia stated the matter was already settled, hinting at John's desire to keep Janice as his letter courier to Naomi. John was surprised. How did she know about his communications with Naomi? Virginia reveals that she has read every single one of their letters, and through Cameron's channels. John realized how scary this woman was. She was in control of everything. He asked about Janice's fate. Virginia responded that an example had to be made. After leaving her office, John encountered Dakota, who urged him to continue investigating. She suspected her sister was deliberately protecting someone, but she didn't know who. To uncover the truth, John decided to exhume Cameron's body for a detailed examination. After digging for half an hour, he finally uncovered Cameron's body. The stench was nearly overwhelming. The man dug a grave in the middle of the night and after half an hour he finally saw the body. The stench is overwhelming. Upon examination he found a stab wound in the body's neck. While examining, a zombie suddenly appeared behind him. By the time John noticed, the zombie had fallen into the pit. But John used Cameron's body to block it. Another zombie joined the attack. But John, using all his strength, smashed its head with a shovel and brutally killed the second one. In Cameron's hand, John found weapon fragments likely from his resistance. Now, by checking for a damaged weapon and its records, John could identify the murderer. The next day, John sought Victor's help. Given their past interaction in Victor's high rank, when he came to the grave, John did not expect after last night's fight Cameron's neck has been blurred almost cannot be seen. They had to use Victor's authority to access the weapon registry. After a long search, John noticed a missing knife. Matching the knife's description to the fragments he found, they seemed identical but the records for that day were torn, indicating a cover-up. John updated Janice on his investigation, promising to save her. Janice, realizing John couldn't change the situation, urged him to stop his inquiry. Virginia entered just then. Victor claimed they were witnesses to Janice's confession. Janice, not wanting to implicate John, admitted to killing Cameron. She claims they planned to run away together, but Cameron changed his mind and she pushed him into a zombies in a fit of pique. John knows that's not what happened, but he can't do anything about it. Thank you for finally unburdening yourself. John said, helplessly, that Janice had confessed to the crime. So could she get a lighter sentence? Virginia said that people need to feel safe, and that an example must be made. John was speechless. After Virginia left, Janice said it didn't matter anymore as she had nothing left to lose. Her brother was dead. Cameron was dead. She had nothing, but John still had Naomi. She revealed that they had hidden several barrels of gasoline in Cameron's house's basement, and a motorcycle stashed 39 miles away. She urged John to leave, saying the place was rotten and doomed. John, however, encouraged Janice not to give up, insisting there was still a chance. John spent his evening alone, drinking somberly as he stared at a map in his hands. At this moment, Jacob entered the room, knowing that John was in a bad mood and came specifically to keep him company and chat. Jacob informed John that Virginia was planning to execute Janice the next morning, since both were from Morgan's team. John had always trusted them. He told Jacob that one must persist in doing the right thing, even if it meant death. Especially as a police officer, John was determined, stating that only one person was guarding Janice, and he planned to rescue Janice and leave this place. Naomi's a nurse. Surely she won't be implicated. Finally, John handed a letter to Jacob, asking him to ensure that Naomi received it. He believed Naomi would understand why he had to do this. John couldn't bear to watch someone be wrongfully executed. In the middle of the night, John prepared his things and headed straight to the cell, only to find Janice missing. He had a bad premonition. John followed a singing voice to the forest outside, where a speaker was tied to a tree. Underneath the tree was a chain with only one foot left on it, and then there were four zombies munching away on something. John emotionlessly killed the zombies, wondering if Janice had really been executed. Upon moving the zombies, he found only a half-eaten body, unrecognizable. At that moment, John saw another zombie in the distance. That's right, it was Janice who had turned into a zombie, his last bit of hope shattered. With deep sorrow, John looked at Janice's half-eaten body, realizing his helplessness. Reluctantly, he ended Janice's suffering. The drifting music seemed so jarring now. 
All John could do was to give Janice a proper burial. Was this community really a warm home? John returned to the neighborhood with his gun in hand. He had a determined look on his face and Jacob called out to him. John says Janice was executed early. Jacob said he knew, leading John to suspect Jacob had betrayed him. However, Victor showed up and claimed that Jacob hadn't told anyone, but Victor knew that John would try to rescue, so he told Virginia, seeing Victor admit this, John could no longer hold back, to prevent John from doing something rash, Victor rushed to fight with him, allowing John to release his pent-up emotions. You killed Janice! Janice was always gonna take the fall, I kept you from going down with her. We could've got away! In theory, Janice's death was inevitable and Victor's actions were to protect John, morally. However, John couldn't accept it. John was utterly disillusioned with the community. Janice was right. This place would destroy everything. The next day, Virginia announced to the community that Janice was the culprit. She cunningly hailed John as a hero who had uncovered the truth. John's heart felt like it was pierced by a thousand arrows. He couldn't do anything, exposing the truth would not only be disbelieved but also endanger Naomi. Virginia also made John a real cavalryman, and apparently she tied John to her ranks. Virginia was a formidable woman. The crowd applauded the supposed hero. Only Dakota she looked at John with disappointment. John was equally disappointed in himself. The next morning, John opened his door to find Naomi, the woman he longed for. Virginia had transferred her here to win over John. John didn't show excitement but looked like a wrong child. Naomi sensed something was off with John but didn't speak of it, perhaps sensing his shame. After traversing half the country in the post-apocalyptic world and enduring countless hardships, Dwight finally found his wife. After a long time, they are naturally very close to each other. But then the walkie-talkie rings, and it's Virginia's man in charge, calling Dwight and Althea on the walkie-talkie. It was mandatory for those out on missions to report back daily. Dwight glanced at the time, realizing they were an hour late for the check-in. He was puzzled, as Althea had supposedly gone back earlier to cover for them, giving the couple some time together. But now it seems that Althea did not go back, with no choice. Dwight responded to the message, apologizing for missing the check-in and explaining they had encountered a horde of zombies that delayed them. The voice on the other end didn't make it difficult for them, merely asking them to investigate and report back in 48 hours. Dwight didn't want to involve his wife, Sherry, in Virginia's team and planned to escape to a place where no one could find them. However, Sherry insisted they couldn't run away, arguing that Virginia would find them and she couldn't just leave like that. Then, Sherry said she would fetch some utensils from the kitchen, Dwight felt something was off, as there was no sound from the kitchen, growing alert, Dwight called for his wife while grabbing his weapon, upon reaching the kitchen, he found it empty, hearing some noise outside, Dwight cautiously approached the door and pulled back the curtain, only to retreat in shock, calling out loudly for his wife, when he turned back, by the time Dwight could see the scene outside again, he was in a strange place, behind him was a man wearing a mask, yelling for his wife, Dwight was more concerned about Sherry's safety than his own predicament. Receiving no response, he lunged at the masked man. In the scuffle, Dwight managed to free himself and grab the man's gun, demanding to know where his wife was. Desperate and almost hysterical, he couldn't bear the thought of losing Sherry again. Just then, Dwight looked up to see several masked individuals pointing guns at him from above the pool. This overwhelming sense of being surrounded was unmistakable and unpleasant. Soon a masked woman reassures Dwight to take it easy none other than his wife, Sherry. She apologized for bringing him in such a manner, explaining that without these people, she might have been dead. Sherry signaled to her companions that Dwight was trustworthy. She then explains to Dwight that these are people that Virginia considers unworthy of the community, and that some of them are the same people she wants to kill. Therefore, they wore masks to avoid being recognized by Virginia's cavalry. Sherry explained to Dwight that she hadn't involved him in their plans against Virginia to keep him out of harm's way. They were working to bring Virginia down using their own methods. A man in their group presented Althea's camera, indicating they knew Dwight was working for Virginia. He wanted to extract information about Virginia's whereabouts from Dwight. Looks like Althea is in their hands too. Dwight said just because they work for Virginia doesn't mean they do it willingly. He claimed ignorance about her location. Ozzy, skeptical, threatened Dwight, saying he could turn his friend into a corpse with a single command. He started counting down on the walkie-talkie. Unmoved by Dwight's explanations, as Ozzy reached one, a voice stopped him. A muscular man descended, removing his mask. 
Dwight recognized him as Logan's former oil refinery worker. Dwight had once captured and then spared him, later intercepting them on the road to prevent them from reaching the oil fields, saving Raleigh from Logan's fate. Neither expected to meet again. Raleigh, knowing Dwight's group as one that helped strangers in the post-apocalyptic world, vouched for their trustworthiness. With Raleigh's backing, the others relented. They soon learned the location of an armored vehicle, destroying it would make dealing with Virginia easier. Just then, Althea approached. Dwight was relieved to see that Althea was all right. Althea said that the armored car has a strong anti-explosion function and is designed to resist these kinds of damage. This kind of attack would only slow down its speed. Ozzy, puzzled, asked how she knew so much. Althea revealed the vehicle was hers, suggesting that instead of destroying it, they should steal it to use against Virginia. Meanwhile, Morgan and his dog were scouring for supplies on another road. Just as he was talking to the dog. Are you like you're not a Morgan took a look at the dog's condition, but he was fine. In a world with few humans and even fewer working vehicles, such an accident seemed highly improbable. Hinting at something amiss, Morgan approached, clutching his axe. Feeling some discomfort from his wound due to the collision, the driver also fell from his seat. Clearly rattled by the impact, Morgan, on guard, asked if the collision was an accident and suggested it was a good time for an apology. The man, sizing up Morgan, inquired about Emil's whereabouts. Surprised, Morgan responded that Virginia knew where he was, subtly probing if the man was affiliated with Virginia. However, the man retorted, asking who Virginia was, followed by another man emerging from the vehicle. They clarified they were only interested in Emil's key. Morgan, naturally unwilling to admit the key was with him, warned them against any aggressive moves, but with a two-to-one advantage. The men weren't inclined to reason with Morgan, and a fight was imminent. Morgan's skills proved too much for them, no longer the pacifist he once was. Morgan showed no mercy to those harboring ill intentions towards him. One of the attackers leaped to choke Morgan, who struggled fiercely to break free, both gasping for air afterward, noticing the key around Morgan's neck. The man lunged again to snatch it. Morgan, with a fierce expression, swung his hand, piercing the man's chest. Morgan realized the key he possessed might unlock something significant. Meanwhile, Dwight and his group prepared an ambush for the armored vehicle at a road junction. Soon they could see the armored car coming from far away. They put on masks so that even if the operation fails, they can't let the people inside see their faces, because they all have friends and family. As the armored vehicle passed by the building, they swiftly followed on horseback. Inside the armored vehicle, there was only one cavalryman driving. He was on the verge of completing his mission and preparing to return to report back. Just then he saw in his mirror a man on horseback behind him. In a matter of seconds, the horse had reached the front of the vehicle. The man knocked out his antenna. Althea, familiar with her own vehicle, knew this would disrupt its radio transmission. Several years after the zombie virus outbreak, a mysterious human organization emerged. They spray-painted a phrase in many places, the end is where we begin. These two were killed trying to steal the keys from Morgan. The same message was found in a building Dwight and Althea once visited, hinting that this organization might be behind the plague. Even Virginia's community, which she ruled with an iron fist, discovered a woman spreading the same message. Virginia would never allow that to be spread on her turf. But the woman who was caught wouldn't say anything. Virginia was preparing to take her back for a thorough interrogation, but the woman snatched a handgun and confronted them. She then told Virginia, what we do has nothing to do with you or anyone else. It's only about the future you want to rebuild. Just as Virginia was about to ask more, the woman chose suicide over revealing anything further, deepening the mystery. There are now three organizations with the agenda of rebuilding the future. First is a military-like group in armor. Second is Virginia, constantly talking about rebuilding the future. Third is this secretive spray-painting organization. What does the future really mean to them? Meanwhile, Sarah and Naomi met on a mission and chatted by the roadside. Soon, John contacted Naomi via radio, asking her to wait for him. Minutes later, John picked up Naomi, with Sarah following in a truck. John revealed his plan to leave with Naomi, disillusioned by Janice's death and the true nature of their surroundings. They had prepared gas and food for their escape. Naomi was unaware of Janice's death details, and John simply expressed his desire to get as far away as possible. Naomi worried about Virginia's pursuit, but John saw it as an opportunity to escape before she realized their departure. As Naomi pondered, Luciana's urgent voice came through the radio, asking for her help at the oil field. Then John's radio also crackled to life. 
urging him to hurry to the oil fields. If they didn't show up, Virginia would surely know they were trying to escape. John can only say, we'll go there and follow their orders, and maybe we can grab a few barrels of oil on the way. Soon, they arrived at the oil fields. When they got out of the car, there was a lot of smoke, and there were a lot of injured people in front of the gate, and they looked like they'd been in a big accident. Naomi quickly asked Sarah to bring out the medical supplies. These were oil field workers from Virginia's community. Fortunately, Luciana was unharmed. She explained that there had been a blowout at one of the wells, burning many people. In addition to those outside, there were more injured inside, including Wes. Luciana said they needed to go in and rescue them, as there was still an open flame inside and the risk of an explosion if the wind changed. They were no longer able to walk, so they had to drive the truck in to bring them out. Luciana cursed upon seeing an approaching vehicle, for Virginia had arrived and her style of operation meant she wouldn't rescue anyone here. Naomi insisted they had to go in and save as many as possible. Unexpectedly, Virginia wanted to join them, not to help but to interrogate the injured workers. Virginia then began assigning tasks, ordering her subordinates to interrogate those outside. Sharkshooter John was sent to a high point to keep watch for any wrongdoers. John whispers to Naomi that if she goes in with Virginia, it will stop her from saving the others. And that's just their nature. They only help others to serve their own ends. Naomi replied that she would do her best to treat everyone and then escape with him. They quickly entered the oil field, now with several more wells than before, one of which was continuously spewing crude oil. Luciana warned to keep an eye on the wind direction and to leave immediately if anything seemed off. Their clothes got dirty with crude oil just after getting out of the car. Virginia asked Luciana how long the well would keep spewing, and Luciana said it could be months or even years. Virginia's concern is not for the workers, but for the amount of crude oil that will be wasted. Then, Virginia saw something that infuriated her. The phrase the end is where we begin appeared again, suggesting that the accident may have been contrived. An angry Virginia declared she wouldn't leave until the culprit was found. When they arrived at the shed, several injured people were still there, one with a ruptured eardrum. Virginia relentlessly interrogated them. Naomi quickly instructed Sarah to bring the truck over to transport the wounded. Virginia showed no concern for their well-being, ordering her subordinates to urgently search the employee dormitories for evidence. Meanwhile, Naomi found Wes in a corner, suffering from a fragment wound in his abdomen that needed immediate attention. As Naomi was contacting Sarah, a zombie lunged at her from behind. Luckily, Virginia shot the zombie just in time. Naomi quickly examined her own arm. It was a slash wound, not a bite. The zombie's hands were bound with steel needles. Virginia immediately questioned John about whether the zombie had come from outside. But John confirmed that the fence was intact, and no zombies had breached it. It was clear that these events were orchestrated by someone. While Naomi continued to actively treat Wes, Virginia remarked, If I were you, I wouldn't waste time on this. You need to let go of those who can't survive. Wes' wounds are so painful he can't move or he'll die from the pain. He needs to be anesthetized. Virginia stopped them, revealing that her man had found paint in Wes's room. She demanded to know why Wes was spreading these views within the community. They were left speechless by her questions. When Virginia pressed Wes about how long he had been with them, Wes replied, I don't know what you're talking about. I just like graffiti. As Virginia pressed on his wound. <laughs> Naomi, unable to watch any longer, administered anesthesia to Wes, escalating the tension. Fortunately, Virginia stopped her subordinates. Recognizing Naomi's significant role in the community, they could take Wes away, but the interrogation would continue. Luciana and Sarah prepared to evacuate with Wes. As Naomi opened the truck door, she froze. The previously injured had turned into zombies, quickly approaching her. Naomi, having survived alone in the post-apocalyptic world, had no problem dispatching zombies. Virginia joined in the fight against the zombies, and soon the truck was cleared. With Wes loaded on board, Naomi urged Luciana to drive off quickly, promising to follow soon. At that moment, Virginia ran out of bullets and called out to Naomi to hurry inside the room. The wind had changed, and the humming sound from the pipelines indicated an imminent explosion. Virginia and Naomi are trapped in the room by zombies. Suddenly, the oil field erupted in a massive explosion, engulfing the entire area in a fiery inferno. The shockwave from the blast knocked Virginia unconscious inside the collapsing building. When Virginia opened her eyes, 
A zombie was lunging at her, she fought back with all her strength, grabbing a rock and striking at the zombie's head, but Virginia was not strong enough to kill the zombies and they bit her on the back of her hand. Virginia screamed in pain, unable to escape, until Naomi, wielding an axe, came to her rescue and killed the zombie. Virginia looked at her hand in disbelief and despair. No. No, no. Inside the walkie-talkie, her men's call of concern rang out, and Virginia forced herself to stay calm and said, Come here quickly. I've been bitten by zombies. Her subordinates informed her that the area was demolished, and she would have to wait. Virginia's pent-up emotions erupted, venting her frustrations into the radio. I don't have any more time! As if in thought, she glances at an axe not far away and Virginia pulls out her belt. As a nurse, Naomi knew what Virginia wanted to do. Virginia then tightened her belt around her forearm, intending to amputate her hand to save her life. She poured alcohol over the wound and stood up to grab the axe. Naomi, quick to react, took the axe away. Despite her typically compassionate nature, Naomi believed Virginia didn't deserve to live. I won't let you do this, Naomi said. All those people outside died because of you. You always forced us to wait and waste time asking questions. Virginia demanded the axe, saying she would do it herself. Naomi shook her head, knowing her time was running out. Virginia desperately lunged for the axe. Naomi forcefully prevented her from getting it. With Virginia's hand injured, Naomi quickly gained the upper hand, holding the axe against Virginia's neck. Virginia was now terrified that Naomi might kill her. Just then, Luciana's voice came through, indicating Wes was barely hanging on. Virginia pleaded, please, help me, Naomi coldly replied, you have to let go of those who can't survive, she was echoing Virginia's earlier words about the workers, at this point, Naomi could only guide Luciana and the others via radio to help Wes remove the fragment, Virginia, still trying to persuade Naomi with her words, knew Naomi was a kind-hearted person, however, Naomi remained resolute and unmoved, focusing only on instructing Luciana through the radio on the surgery. Virginia started to panic, pleading, What do you want? I'll give you anything. Naomi replied coldly, All I want is to wake up every morning and see my husband. Your death will make that possible. Virginia was stunned. Luciana then informed Naomi that Wes's condition had stabilized and they were coming to pick her up. Virginia cried and said, Well, you managed to save a man. I have no right to ask anything of you now, but there's one thing you must do for me. Please. Dakota is my sister, and I hope you can keep her safe. Everything I've done was for her. I love her very much. Naomi just looked at Virginia, perhaps at that moment. Virginia was just a vulnerable woman trying to protect her family. Naomi's heart softened. She poured alcohol on the axe and said, Don't make me regret what I do today. Wait! Wait! When Virginia woke up again, Naomi was treating her wound. Without Naomi, the nurse, Virginia would have bled to death even if she had cut off her hand. Naomi said I do want to ask you for something. Virginia responded, if you want gasoline, there's none left. It's all gone. Soon, John walked in, seeing each other unharmed. They embraced tightly. The oil field was completely destroyed. Virginia's subordinates, Marcus and Hill, came to pick her up. The first thing Virginia wanted was for them to contact her sister. She longed to hear her voice over the radio. Wes also woke up in the truck. Seemingly out of danger, Sarah and Luciana couldn't understand why Naomi would save Virginia. Wes, too, was puzzled. Everyone had hoped for Virginia's death so they could be free. Naomi explained, she promised to give us the hospital. Luciana and Sarah say how can you trust her when so many people died today because of her? Naomi countered, with the hospital, we can treat more people, and it will be ours to run independently. But Luciana and Sarah were still furious believing it was the perfect chance to kill Virginia without dirtying their hands. We four can't run a hospital alone. Sarah pointed out. That's why I found us some help. Naomi said. Just then, a car arrived with Sarah's brother, Wendell. Inside, Sarah finally smiled, reunited with her brother. John found Naomi. She was about to share the news about the hospital. But John interrupted. I filled up the gas. There's a fork in the road five kilometers ahead. We can escape. If we're spotted. We'll say we took a wrong turn and keep moving. Naomi says we can't just leave now that we have a hospital. I don't want to leave. John was a little overwhelmed. Naomi said, Every time we go somewhere, something bad happens. I don't want to keep running anymore. I used to think Virginia was a hindrance to us doing good, but she has changed now. At that moment, Virginia's car passed by, nodding at Naomi. 
John knew that his wife had been blinded by Virginia and he knew exactly how cunning she was, but Naomi is still trying to persuade John to stay here with her. You'll follow us, won't you? Naomi asked. Knowing John loved her, he could only reply. Of course. Soon the car was heading towards the Virginia community. John, always an optimist, now wore a face of worry and seriousness. When they reached the fork, John chose to leave, feeling a sense of revulsion and disgust towards Virginia's community. A fully armed cavalry unit had one mission today, to ensure the safe arrival of a vehicle. It had been a week since the oil field incident. The person in charge of this mission was none other than Victor. Dakota was well aware that Virginia had sent them merely as a precaution to prevent her escape. She told Victor that the cavalry was also there to watch him, as Virginia didn't fully trust him either. Victor was aware of this but expressed confidence in gaining Virginia's trust eventually. Dakota suggested that now was the best time to escape. Virginia had lost a hand, and John had been missing for a week. But Victor never considered fleeing. He aimed to earn Virginia's approval and gain power. Suddenly, a horse approached them. Victor sensed something was amiss and instructed Dakota to stay in the vehicle. The horse belonged to a scout from their unit. Repeated calls to the cavalry went unanswered, indicating trouble. Mounting the horse, Victor took one rider to investigate, leaving the rest to protect Dakota. They've come a long way. The road here is blocked by a big tree. It looks like someone must have done it on purpose. Just when Victor was puzzled there was the sound of horses' hooves behind him. Those cavalry's horses had already run to this place. No need to think that something must have happened to the escort. They rushed towards the opposite direction at full speed. Along the road there are still scattered horses. When they arrived at the place where the escort was, the cavalry had all been killed and were lying on the ground. And the car and Dakota had disappeared. The cavalry had mutated by now. The attackers might be the same ones who had hit the oil fields. It doesn't matter if the cavalry is dead. The main thing is that Dakota is gone. They decided not to report back to Virginia just yet. Focusing on finding Dakota to redeem themselves. Not far from there, Alicia and Charlie were on border patrol. Victor had been calling them all day about an urgent matter. But Alicia was reluctant to respond. It's been six weeks since Victor put them here. She believed Victor had become corrupt in his quest for power and felt no obligation to help him. On the 50th call, Victor's tone was almost pleading, prompting Alicia to answer, albeit begrudgingly. Victor requested a meeting. Out of respect for their past relationship, they agreed to meet. Victor had already found their car. He got straight to the point. Our guard team was attacked. Dakota must have tried to escape by car and crashed here, then continued on foot. Alicia couldn't help but feel a bit of schadenfreude. You lost Virginia's sister. You're in deep trouble now. Victor, somewhat helpless, relied on Alicia's help to find Dakota. Alicia was familiar with the area, and Dakota admired her greatly. Ultimately, Alicia agreed to assist Victor. They started searching in one direction from the car. Charlie was puzzled about why they were helping Victor. Alicia clarified. It's not about helping him. We need someone who can stand up to the cavalry. Whoever attacked the oil field or the guard team has the capability to fight them. As they walked, a zombie appeared, posing no challenge for Alicia. Another approached Charlie, who calmly dispatched it. Over the past six weeks, Alicia had been training Charlie in fighting zombies, but Alicia hesitated with the next zombie, who knocked her to the ground. Charlie quickly killed it from behind. This zombie was different, seemingly modified with needle and thread. A bizarre hobby Alicia couldn't fathom, they noticed a hunter's cabin nearby, a likely refuge if Dakota had fled. Alicia had Charlie keep watch while she slipped inside, opting for a reinforced side door to be ready for any confrontation. The cabin was quiet, filled with various animal trophies that could startle the faint-hearted. Then, Alicia heard music coming from upstairs. She cautiously ascended, the singing growing closer, clearly coming from below the attic, peeking out. Alicia saw a man apparently experimenting, fitting a deer antler onto a zombie's head. The strange zombie outside was probably related to this man. Alicia could also see that the zombies were wearing the insignia of Virginia's cavalry on their chests. Could the man be the one who attacked the escort? To avoid detection, Alicia pulled back. When she looked again, the man had left the table, leaving only the zombie behind. Alicia is wondering where he went. Suddenly. Don't worry. It won't hurt nearly as much as you think. Don't worry. It won't hurt nearly as much as you think. When Alicia regains consciousness, she finds herself surrounded by various animal specimens. 
even limbs and organs on a table, it takes her a few minutes to fully awaken and realize she's been tied to a table, desperate to escape before her captor returns. She cleverly uses a nearby antler to cut through the tape binding her hands and then frees herself from the ropes. Just then, she hears noises outside the captor must be returning. Alicia pulled off the antlers from the machine as a defensive weapon and hid behind the door in preparation for a sneak attack. As the doorknob turned, the door opened and Alicia rushed out to make the first move. To her shock, it's Dakota who opens the door, not the captor. Alicia didn't understand why Dakota was here, but she didn't care to ask. The most important thing was to get out of here. However, the man, Ed, enters, raising Alicia's defenses instantly. Ed tries to explain, claiming he only injected her with a hunter's tranquilizer. But Alicia is skeptical. Dakota interjects, explaining that her security team was attacked and Ed took her in. Alicia was also confused about who attacked the escort. Dakota said that there were a lot of zombies coming out of the woods. And while the escorts were dealing with the zombies, someone jumped out and killed the escorts. And she drove off before she could see. Ed said he found Dakota on the side of the road. Alicia remains wary of Ed especially knowing his disturbing actions with zombies. But Ed says he just made the zombies a little scarier so people would stay away and not bother him. Dakota's assurances slightly ease Alicia's suspicions. Ed reveals his family is also dead, prompting Dakota to share her loss. Virginia killed her parents. Alicia begins to understand Dakota's eagerness to leave Virginia. Dakota, feeling safe with Ed, expresses her desire to stay. Alicia, feigning a need for a blanket, has other plans. In the hallway, she encounters Charlie, who sneaked in out of concern for Alicia. Charlie told Alicia that the man had sealed all the doors and windows after he found you, and that if she tried to leave, she'd make a lot of noise. Alicia tells Charlie to stay hidden while she devises an escape plan. At the workbench, she secretly stashes a screwdriver. Ed and Dakota enter the room, leading Alicia to confront them about being trapped. Ed insists he's only protecting Dakota from potential killers. Alicia counters, saying the best protection would be to let Dakota go. As Virginia, her sister, will surely send people to find her. Ed thinks about it and says you should leave in the morning. It's not safe at night. Dakota is puzzled as to why Alicia revealed their situation to Ed. Alicia explains that the zombie Ed was using for his specimens was a cavalryman, hinting at Ed's potential involvement in the attack on Dakota's security team. Alicia warns that staying here might turn them into Ed's next specimens. In the middle of the night, Alicia stealthily reaches Ed's radio and contacts Virginia on her frequency. Virginia, tending to her wounds, is confused by Alicia's call. Alicia explains that she's with Dakota, whose security team was ambushed, and offers to return Dakota in exchange for her and Charlie's freedom. Virginia, concerned for her sister's safety, reluctantly agrees. She muses why so many are desperate to escape the community she built. Alicia and Dakota fall asleep on the sofa to conserve energy. Meanwhile, upstairs, Ed activates a remote control, and loudspeakers outside Blair, attracting zombies from miles around. These zombies, bizarrely modified by Ed, swarm towards the house. Alicia confronts Ed about his actions. Ed says, I'm bringing back all my work, which is, of course, the zombies outside the door. Ed told Alicia that Dakota didn't want to leave, but you told me it wasn't safe, so I brought my creations back to make sure no one gets hurt. Ed then pulls out a pistol and tells them to go upstairs and he'll protect them. The strange music continues, and more grotesque zombies gather. Dakota and Alicia are locked in a room. Suddenly, Charlie appears saying she's stolen the keys, radio, and Alicia's weapon while Ed slept. Alicia said Ed could wake up any minute. Charlie was proud to say that Ed wasn't going to wake up anytime soon. Dakota suggests hiding where Virginia can't find them, but Alicia doesn't respond. Dakota doesn't know she's a bargaining chip. After reaching the ground floor, they quickly turn off the music, causing some zombies to disperse. But then, Ed's voice echoes behind them. He accuses Charlie of not injecting the needle properly into the vein, questioning their motives and insisting he only wanted to ensure their safety. Alicia reluctantly lowers her weapon, and Dakota, wanting to avoid further conflict, suggests Ed could leave with them. Right? Yeah. No. Ed, however, suspects Alicia of being a loyalist to Virginia, especially after discovering she used the radio to contact her. Just as Ed prepares to kill Alicia, she grabs his hand, and they tussle, falling to the ground. Alicia is once again down for the count, but just as Ed aims his gun at her, Charlie launches a surprise attack. Alicia, seizing the moment, kicks Ed, 
sending him tumbling backward onto a chair. In a shocking twist, a set of antlers impales Ed through the chest. Alicia's a little upset at this point. She didn't want to kill Ed. Although Ed was a bit paranoid, he was trying to protect them. Their fight had drawn the zombies back. And now Ed's condition was critical. Pulling out the antlers would cause him to bleed out. Ed was convinced that the solid gate was starting to shake. And it looked like it wasn't going to hold. Recognizing his extreme actions, Ed urges them to escape upstairs and break through the boards. He decides to stay behind to buy them time. Dakota refuses to leave without Ed, who confesses his desire to protect them stemmed from failing to save his own family. He pleads for them to leave for their safety. Alicia reluctantly agrees, but Ed pulls her aside, warning her against any drastic actions, cautioning her of the guilt that follows such decisions. By this time, the gate was about to be breached, and Alicia had to retreat. Ed watches the zombies he created enter, unafraid. In a tragic twist, he can't control them, but there seems a dark solace in meeting his end at the hands of his own creations. Dakota and Alicia can only watch helplessly as the zombies tear Ed apart. They're puzzled as some zombies start heading outside. Seizing the opportunity, Alicia heads downstairs and swiftly takes down two zombies inside. Before Alicia can act, a figure swiftly decapitates a zombie it's Morgan, and there's no time for reunions now. Alicia turns to face the zombies feasting on Ed. These weirdly modified zombies are no different from regular zombies in combat. Morgan took off his hat. Alicia, in disbelief, never imagined he was still alive. They embrace tightly. How are you here? I heard the music. No, I... How are you alive? Charlie was naturally happy that Morgan was still alive. He had saved her life. They had all heard Morgan's last words over the radio that night, believing he was dead. Alicia is eager to know who saved him, but Morgan doesn't know either. In the morning, they bury Ed, acknowledging he wasn't a bad person, just extreme in his methods. Morgan mentions he's found a place they can go, where Dwight and Althea are already waiting. Charlie notices Alicia's troubled expression and starts a conversation. After Ed's words, Alicia feels using Dakota as a pawn is wrong. She plans to join Morgan in overthrowing Virginia. In a private conversation with Morgan, Alicia learns he's changed his approach. He plans to use Dakota in exchange for their captured people and admits to attacking her security team to capture her. Alicia questions if Morgan was behind the oil field's explosion, but he denies it. Alicia knows Morgan wants to recover their people, and she initially planned to use Dakota too, but she questions why they can't have Dakota on their side to defeat Virginia. Morgan thought it was the only way. This leads to a dispute between them. Charlie and Dakota, drawn by the noise, enter the room. Unaware of the reason behind Alicia and Morgan's argument, Alicia makes her stance clear, even willing to confront Morgan physically to prevent his plan. Alicia is ready to leave with the girls, prepared to fight Morgan if necessary. However, Morgan can't let them leave like this. He firmly believes that everything he's done has been for the purpose of reuniting them. If they could not work together, all his efforts would be in vain. He suggests a new plan, including Dakota in their journey to the dam. They reach a compromise and decide to head to the dam together. As they are leaving, Victor arrives, relieved that Alicia found Dakota. Alicia, I know I can count on you. Surprisingly, Alicia informs him that Dakota will join them. Morgan emerges, and Victor, shocked, questions if Virginia is aware of his survival. Morgan said she must have known, but she just didn't tell you. After all, Virginia still doesn't trust Victor enough to let him in on these secrets. Morgan invites Victor, but he refuses, insisting on taking Dakota with him. Their disagreement leads to a standoff. Alicia, weapon in hand, makes her position clear. Do you really want to do this? Do you? Outnumbered, Victor is forced to relent. Watching them leave, returning to the community, Virginia immediately seeks Dakota. Victor reveals she's with Morgan. Which side of this are you on? Yours. Which paradoxically earns him Virginia's trust. She decides to show Victor some secrets. I told you the day would come when I would call you up for the big show. Today is that day, Victor. Leading him through a hidden door. Inside, Victor is shocked to find pregnant Grace. Imprisoned there. Get up. John leaves a note on the table, takes a deep breath, and decides to end his life amidst the apocalypse. Just as he prepares to pull the trigger, zombies inconveniently appear at the door. Suicide requires courage. And John drinks more, 
stealing himself, but as he readies again, another zombie emerges from the water. Since leading Virginia's group, John has returned to the cabin where he first met Naomi, only to find its door long gone, he wants to end his life without his body being desecrated by zombies, so he sets out to find a door to ensure this, curiously, the bridge is now swarming with zombies, likely someone's doing, John doesn't care, he just wants a door for a peaceful death, arriving at a house, he finds several zombies at the entrance, he yells, drawing them towards him, The presence of zombies suggests someone inside, so he cautiously enters. The house is silent, but bloodstains on the floor put him on alert. Oh, John, Dakota. It turns out to be a false alarm. John figures Dakota is hiding from Virginia, initially suspecting her of drawing the zombies to the bridge. But Dakota clarifies it wasn't her but someone inside the house. When they opened the door, Morgan was sitting on the floor. <laughs> Turns out Morgan and Alicia took Dakota and Charlie away, but with Virginia's cavalry hot on their trail, they had no choice but to split up and head for the dam. During the escape, Morgan's wound reopened, so they rested here temporarily. John is shocked but relieved to find his old friend alive. Maybe fate intervened in his suicide attempt to lead him to Morgan. While they were catching up, there was a commotion outside. John and Dakota hide behind shelves, and Morgan in the bathroom. The intruder was Virginia's henchman, Marcus who didn't realize he was only inches away from them. Since they didn't know how many people were out there, they didn't dare to act rashly. Marcus is intrigued by something on the wall. He senses that someone has been here and pulls out his walkie-talkie to contact Virginia. John aims his gun at Marcus, ready to act, with Dakota and even Morgan signaling him to take the shot. But John can't bring himself to kill without cause. Marcus's signal on the walkie-talkie didn't seem to be good. And then he left the house. Dakota thinks John should have killed him, but John stands by his choice. They then go to John's cabin, where he successfully finds a door, albeit slightly too small. Morgan tells John they need to head 40 miles north to rescue their friends and rebuild their home. This inevitably means a confrontation with Virginia, and sharpshooter John would be a formidable asset in battle. Just then, Dakota finds a knife handle fragment. John said it was a fragment of the weapon that killed Cameron. Finding the knife wielder would have led to Cameron's killer. But unfortunately it didn't. Suddenly, Virginia's voice comes through the radio. Morgan doesn't want to risk exposure by responding, but then Grace's voice is heard. Morgan had to answer the intercom, and he worriedly asked if she was okay. Grace said she was fine and the baby was seven months old, and I was so happy you were still alive. Virginia threatens that if anything happens to her sister, Morgan's team will suffer, and her cavalry will soon find him. Daniel, Luciana, and others have been captured. Morgan realizes they has to get out of here. John agrees to help them cross the bridge but won't join them. Morgan, confused, prepares to leave. Gunshots force them into hiding. Ah! Marcus arrives, and as Morgan tries to pull him down, he gets caught in a lasso. Marcus is dragging Morgan along with him. John pulled out his rifle. He didn't want to kill anyone, but his best friend's life was in danger. Morgan is okay, just with a further torn wound. John fires another shot at Marcus to prevent him from turning into a zombie. Their vehicle is damaged, but they find an abandoned car. John takes on the task of repairing it for reuse. While searching for materials, he finds a door that fits his purpose. Dakota doesn't understand its use, but Morgan explains that John doesn't plan to join them. Morgan sees the puzzle John left on the table and understands his suicide plan. John admits he wants to help them cross the bridge but then return to end his life. He feels responsible for Janice's death and his inaction in the store nearly cost Morgan his life. Morgan disagrees with John's decision. He recalls how John didn't abandon him when he was weary of conflict and injured. John helped Morgan find friends who became like family. Despite this, John remains unmoved, claiming he will only assist them in crossing the bridge. Soon, they retrofit the car, temporarily fitting John's door at the front to split the zombies on either side. John entrusts the driving to Dakota, handing her his handgun for safety. He and Morgan will handle keeping zombies from getting entangled in the wheels. Once everything is ready, Morgan steps out of the car to untie the rope securing the fence. Immediately, two zombies charge out. As Morgan gets back in the vehicle, John signals Dakota to proceed. Dakota is incredibly nervous at this point. Yeah. 
Nervously, Dakota engages first gear and starts to drive across the bridge swarming with zombies. She takes a deep breath as the car hits the fence, now facing the daunting task of pushing through the horde. John and Morgan are ready for combat inside the car. Despite the protection of the glass, the sheer number of zombies is enough to unnerve anyone. As the car slowly advances, zombies crowd around, and they relentlessly fight them off from inside. Thankfully, the car's modifications make progress easier. After John takes down a zombie, he instructs Dakota to shift to second gear and offers reassuring words to calm her nerves. Morgan is still able to kill zombies with one hand despite his injuries, but he's a little out of his depth at this point. Then, trouble strikes. The car seems stuck, unable to move. John looks out to find a zombie jammed in the tire. He advises Dakota to switch back to first gear and floor the accelerator. The tire turns into a meat grinder, but the car remains immobile. The number of surrounding zombies increases, forcing them to continue fighting. Soon, the car's generator fails. Morgan was injured and John volunteered to fix it. Luckily, the door panel could temporarily keep the zombies. As he inspects the engine, a zombie lunges at his arm. John fights to keep from being bitten. Inside the car, Dakota, panicking, takes John's gun and shakily aims at the zombie. Fortunately, she shoots it down without missing. John quickly fixes the disconnected wires and signals Dakota to start the car. The car finally roars to life. John, lying on the hood, steadies himself. Dakota yelled for Morgan to get down, then shifted into fifth gear and stomped on the accelerator and raced forward. To shake off the zombies clinging to the car, Dakota crashes into the bridge's railing, flinging two zombies off. John kicks off the last zombie from the car. They exchange relieved glances, finally breathing a sigh of relief. Only a few zombies remain on the bridge, and Morgan, in pain, finishes them off. A few minutes later, the bridge is littered with corpses. Morgan hands John a photo he found at John's house a childhood picture of John with his father, who never returned from a trip when he was younger. Morgan hopes the photo of John and his father will give John a reason to keep living, but John is adamant about not joining them, unmoved by Morgan's efforts. In a drastic move, Morgan contacts Virginia on the radio, arranging to meet at a cabin near the bridge, intending to force John to leave. John is furious, insisting Morgan has no right to interfere with his decision. Morgan counters, reminding John of the time he helped Morgan despite his wish to be left alone after his leg broke. Morgan's survival is due to John's intervention, and he can't stand by and watch his best friend choose death. John is left pondering Morgan's words. Meanwhile, Morgan prepares to scout the area, while John agrees to ensure their car is functioning correctly. After checking, they realize that the red clips holding the wires had fallen off, and they had to split up to look carefully on the bridge, most likely amongst the zombies' corpses. Dakota quickly finds the clips, but as she reaches for it, a not-quite-dead zombie grabs her leg. She falls, unable to reach her gun, and in a panic, stabs the zombie in the head with a dagger. When John arrives, Dakota acts defensively, as if hiding something. John notices the dagger, the same one used to kill Cameron. John looked at Dakota with suspicion. Dakota was about to make excuses, but John seemed to have already guessed a terrifying truth. He asked directly, Did you kill Cameron? Is Virginia covering for you? Dakota, with a hint of regret, said, I never expected Janice to get dragged into this. John, perplexed, asked, Why then did you encourage me to investigate? Dakota replied, I just wanted to create an illusion to divert attention elsewhere. John, raising his voice, demanded, Why did you kill Cameron? Dakota revealed, Cameron found out about my secret way in and out of the community and told her sister, She took away my only escape route. John asked, Is that why you killed Cameron? Dakota retorted, What difference does it make? Everyone is ruthless for their own ends. My sister did the same. So did the cavalry. That's just the way the world works now. Then Dakota picked up a handgun from the ground, unwilling to let anyone ruin her image in the eyes of others. John tried to calm Dakota's agitated state, promising he wouldn't tell anyone. He even put away his weapon to show he meant no harm. John had gravely misjudged the ruthlessness of this child. Why? So we can get oh. The searing pain was suffocating him. Dakota, tense but not fearful, whispered an apology. John, watching Dakota, was speechless. It doesn't always have to mean something, John. As he fell into the water, John sank to the riverbed, his blood tinting the water's red. In that moment, he was calm, but the sight of a photo with his father reignited his will to live. Wounded, John swam upwards, 
thankfully surfacing and clinging to a door he had found earlier. The river carried him away. Dakota raised her pistol again, ready to cut down the roots, her sister's way of doing things. Fortunately, Morgan arrived in time, and Dakota immediately aimed at him. Morgan, confused, asked what she had done and where John was. Through tears, Dakota said, I didn't want this, but I had no choice. Under Morgan's questioning, she revealed that John had been swept away by the river after being shot in the chest. Morgan, noticing the dagger in Dakota's hand, seemed to understand what had happened. He pressed his axe against Dakota's neck. Unfazed, Dakota declared, You won't hurt me. I am your reason to live. Want to know who saved you in the canyon? It was me. She then detailed the events, forcing Morgan to believe her. Dakota saved Morgan not out of recognition of his, but to use him against and even kill her sister Virginia. Morgan was disheartened, unwilling to believe what had transpired. Meanwhile, Virginia and Naomi arrived at John's cabin, finding it empty, just as Virginia was about to explode. Morgan's voice came through the radio. He reported John's serious injury and pleaded for help to find him. Naomi, anxious, took over the radio, asking where John was. Morgan replied John had been swept downstream. For her sister, Virginia had no choice but to send the cavalry to search for John, hoping he would survive. Elsewhere, Alicia and Charlie arrived at the dam, joining Dwight and Althea. Morgan's voice came again, instructing Dwight to prepare for a possible battle with Virginia and to contact Sherry for a coordinated strike. Back at the cabin, a worried Naomi stepped outside. She suddenly turned, grabbing medical supplies upon spotting John at the water's edge. She ran towards him, but froze as she neared. Even without seeing John's face, Naomi had a bad feeling. Indeed, John had turned into a zombie. Maybe he forced himself to come here at the last moment of his death. This is the place where he and his father used to come. It's also where he met the love of his life. Naomi. The most heartbreaking scene unfolded. The lovers were so close, yet couldn't embrace. It was with a heavy heart that Naomi had to give John his last ride. John has always been a sunny uncle who treats his lover with utmost care. The door he found became his final. The door he found became his final home. Naomi's heart was shattered. The man who loved her was gone forever. She wished John could have been by her side through the apocalypse. But now she had to bury him herself. Spotting John's fallen gun, Naomi bent down to pick it up. Looking at Virginia, who was calling for Morgan in the distance, she had a thought. But the sound of a bullet being chambered snapped her back to reality. Virginia's men weren't going to let Naomi keep the gun. Reluctantly, Naomi handed over the weapon. She confronted Virginia. Why did your sister kill my husband? I saved your life. Virginia, because you told me what Dakota meant to you, I showed mercy. And now my husband is dead because of Dakota. Virginia fell silent, then admitted. I don't know why Dakota did that. Naomi, clearly skeptical, retorted. I think you do know. Unable to meet Naomi's gaze, Virginia turned away. That night, Daniel, Luciana and the others were brought out. Their lives in the hands of others, forced to kneel and await their fate. Victor, following Virginia's orders, had brought them out. Soon after, Virginia returned. Watching Naomi hold John's hat, Luciana inquired about John, and she deduced from Naomi's heartbroken expression that John was probably gone. Luciana's outcry, how many more have died because of you? Infuriated Virginia, who ordered her men to teach Luciana a lesson, Daniel sees this and rushes to try and stop the cavalry. Victor just looks on coldly. Virginia is pissed off that she can't find Morgan, so she brings them out to ask where Morgan is. She aimed her gun at each person, seeking information, but no one spoke. Virginia knew they were unlikely to know Morgan's location, as she had kept them captive. It seemed she might have to resort to more drastic measures. Over the radio, Virginia warned, Morgan, I know you're listening. If you don't return Dakota to me now, bad things will happen. I'll blow Grace's smart head off. Her man aimed at Grace's head, leaving the others powerless to resist. Virginia raised her only hand. It's fall signaling Grace's end. Grace comforted her unborn child. It's gonna be a brat part of Lawton's future. Right here. Then, Morgan arrived on horseback, axe in hand. Grace breathed a sigh of relief. Morgan said to kill me, including any of my mates, and you'd never see your sister again. This was the first time Virginia had seen Morgan since the canyon. You think wearing a killer's clothes scares me? She scoffed. Morgan retorted, You should be scared because your end is near. Your present, your past, everything you have will be taken from you. 
I know the feeling. I've been there, Virginia asked. Are you done? You're alone, and I have a whole group. Hand over my sister or I start killing. One by one, ignoring Virginia, Morgan addressed the crowd loudly. You all need to hear the truth about Virginia. She's a liar, a hypocrite. She builds a future on rules but destroys everything if it threatens her. And she didn't stick to her rules. Cameron wasn't killed by Janice. It was her sister, Dakota. Virginia covered it up and framed Janice. Virginia finally panicked because the cavalry had started to lower their guns. Morgan's words were reshaping their worldview, with the situation slipping from her control. Virginia turned to Victor. Now's your chance to make a name for yourself. Shoot Morgan. As Virginia tried to justify herself to the others, Morgan continued. John discovered Virginia's dirty deeds and paid with his life. Virginia, desperate to silence Morgan, ordered Victor to shoot. But Victor replied. Morgan's right about everything. Victor's gun was his answer to Virginia. Didn't you ask me to prepare for this moment? I did. And so did they, he said. As other rangers raised their guns, you tasked me with building an army. You have to be careful of me using it against you. Victor warned Virginia. Virginia was utterly shocked. Was she really going to lose everything tonight? Still, she asked Morgan, where's Dakota? Victor declared, you'll never see her again. I'll bury her in front of Janice's grave. You can choose how. Virginia watched as her rangers aimed their guns at her, with only two remaining by her side. She lost all reason, before Virginia could fire. Victor made the first move. Virginia was shot in the chest. Then she took Grace hostage and told everyone to drop their guns. With Grace in her grasp, all Morgan could do was shout for Virginia to leave. Virginia thought she was safe holding Grace, but then one of the rangers took Daniel hostage. Unexpectedly, Victor didn't obey Morgan. His goal was to eliminate Virginia and gain full control. A fierce gunfight erupted. Naomi and others had to hide under a vehicle to avoid the bullets. Daniel and Grace were used as hostages. Virginia ordered her men to take them to another location for confinement. The vehicle started moving away, with Virginia using it as a shield to reach another car. But Morgan has been here waiting for a long time, and he puts an axe to Virginia's neck and demands that she give back Grace and Daniel. Virginia, confident, told Morgan, killing me means killing Grace and Daniel. Your only choice is to save me. Victor's voice came from outside, urging Morgan to hand over Virginia. Morgan revealed he had Grace and Daniel. Victor promised the rangers would save them, warning Morgan not to be foolish over her, or he'd regret it. After much deliberation, Morgan decided to flee with Virginia. Victor, biting back curses and considering their past, symbolically fired a single shot. What the hell are you doing? Morgan! We will find you, Morgan! Morgan, with Virginia in tow, fled to the water tower where he had once sought refuge while injured. They needed to tend to Virginia's wounds to prevent further bleeding. After attending to her injury, Morgan took out a walkie-talkie. He kept his promise to get Virginia out. He wanted to make sure Grace and Daniel were safe. Virginia contacted her subordinates, and Grace's voice could be heard on the other end. Morgan finally felt some relief. Virginia shared her location with her team, instructing them to hurry and pick her up. It seemed like a cycle. Morgan had once lived here while gravely injured, and now Virginia was in a similar situation. Morgan voluntarily brought up that he knew who had saved him in the canyon. Naturally, Virginia is curious about who saved him. Yes, sister. Virginia couldn't believe Morgan's claim that it was Dakota who had saved him and had traveled so far. She thought he was talking nonsense. As Dakota couldn't have run so far, Morgan replied, You don't know your sister as well as you think. Virginia then asks Dakota if she saved Morgan because of her, to which Morgan replies that she believes he will kill her. Seeing Virginia's disbelief, Morgan showed her the note Dakota had left him, and Virginia recognized the handwriting. Virginia's emotions became uncontrollable upon seeing the note, and Morgan was curious about what she had done to make Dakota hope for her death. In the midst of Morgan's questions, Virginia finally revealed a secret. Dakota was not her sister but her daughter. This revelation left Morgan stunned. Suddenly, they heard the sound of a vehicle approaching from outside. Morgan realized that something was wrong and hurriedly pulled Virginia away. They had just approached a car when the familiar armored vehicle emerged from the woods and began firing indiscriminately in their direction. Morgan could only drive the car at breakneck speed, presumably revealing the location when Virginia spoke to her men about the address just now. The armored car was in hot pursuit. The attackers were Sherry and her group, determined to kill Virginia while she was vulnerable and alone. Unfortunately, the car's gas tank had been punctured earlier, 
So Morgan had to abandon it by the roadside and escape into the woods with Virginia. The armored vehicle relentlessly pursued them. Their intention was clear. They had to kill Virginia today. With her injured and the attackers closing in. It was only a matter of time before they caught up. Morgan decided to lead the attackers away. And Virginia went on her way. Stumbling and falling in her haste. As she crawled through a tree hollow. A zombie approached her. Just as the zombie was closing in, Sherry emerged from behind the tree and dispatched the zombie with her gun. She then pointed the gun at Virginia, ready to kill her. Sherry knew that Virginia was just trying to buy time, and she was about to make her move when Morgan suddenly jumped out and pleaded with her not to kill Virginia. Sherry doesn't understand what Morgan is up to. Virginia also found it strange that she had never seen this woman before and couldn't understand why she was trying to kill her. Sherry responded, We may not have a personal vendetta against you, but I hate people like you. Morgan took advantage of this opportunity and quickly incapacitated Sherry with just a few moves. Sherry, unwilling to back down, retorted, you're just as bad as Virginia. Morgan, pretending to help others while your actions have hurt everyone, Morgan replied, when the time is right, Virginia will get what she deserves, but not now. He then proceeded to take Virginia away from the scene. Morgan then found a fishing net to secure Virginia's hand. Having been a father himself, he understood Virginia's desire to see Dakota. He planned to take Virginia to the dam to meet Dakota. When Virginia learns that the dam is full of her acquaintances, she realizes that she has too many enemies and asks Morgan to let her take Dakota far away and never see them again. Virginia believed that Morgan had exposed his location for a reason and feared that once she entered the dam, she wouldn't leave alive. Morgan said something that deeply saddened Virginia. What makes you think Dakota would want to go with you? They eventually arrived at the dam, and Virginia was shocked by what she saw. Morgan had done so much in secret to find such a perfect place. Alicia was the first to come out and question why Morgan had brought Virginia. Dwight also expressed his confusion. Virginia was surprised to see Dwight and Althea, whom she had believed to be turned into zombies. It turned out that they had been deceiving her. Morgan explained that he couldn't risk using the radio to contact them in case someone was listening. Virginia had lost her community but still had Daniel and Grace as leverage. Virginia noticed the peaceful and hardworking atmosphere among the people at the dam. Rachel comes out and Virginia greets her warmly. Virginia felt that Isaac would not be happy about her presence. Morgan mentioned that Virginia wouldn't stay there, and he intended to take her to meet Dakota. However, Althea informed them over the radio that Victor had arrived with a large group. Almost surrounding the dam, Victor said, I know Virginia is inside, and many here have a grudge against her. Shortly after, Sherry and her group tracked them down in the armored vehicle. The situation had become quite challenging. Morgan directly asked Victor, What are you planning to do with Virginia? Victor simply replied, We just want justice. If we hand over Virginia, Grace and Daniel will probably be killed. Alicia questioned Victor, What will you do if we don't give you Virginia? Victor said, We'll come in and get her ourselves. At this point, Virginia spoke up. She said, I know all the people outside. Even if they can't get in, they will ruin everything you've built here. Virginia proposed a change in the terms of the trade. She continued, I volunteer to surrender. Let Dakota stay here and have a chance at a fresh start. All of John's actions were my fault. I thought Dakota needed me, but it seems that the freedom here is what she truly needs. Virginia made one final request. When I go out, they will surely torture me to death. I hope you can execute me in front of them. She'll have her men release Grace and the others. A few minutes later, Morgan walked out of the dam with Virginia. She looked nothing like the ruthless woman she used to be. Everyone was waiting to see how Virginia would be punished. Virginia was bewildered by how many people despised her. She couldn't help but wonder if she was truly that detestable. Before her execution, she spoke up. I want to say something before I die. Everything I did was to ensure your survival. I can go to my death, but it has to be at the hands of Morgan. Initially, Victor was reluctant, but upon hearing that they could exchange Virginia for Grace's safety, he agreed. Morgan gestured for Virginia to come to a nearby rock, which was undoubtedly an execution platform. Virginia rested her head against the rock. She was prepared to pay for her actions in this post-apocalyptic world. Morgan aimed at Virginia's neck. Dwight turned away. Unwilling to witness the scene, everyone in the post-apocalyptic world had taken lives to some extent, but using such brutal means to kill an unarmed person was difficult for anyone to stomach. However, on the other hand, Virginia deserved her fate. Waiting for the beheading was a torturous process. Even the usually composed Morgan felt nervous, as he looked at the woman about to be executed. Morgan reminisced about all the things Virginia had done.
when the blade was about to fall. Everyone watching felt a tightness in their hearts. Taking a deep breath, Morgan prepared to carry out the deed. Oh, oh. Oh, Please, you want to do? The future I'm trying to build if we start like this, then we are no better than you! We are no better than her! Enough! It's not enough! In the end, though, Morgan couldn't bring himself to do it. He needed Virginia to reveal the truth to Dakota. He took Virginia back to the dam again. All three parties know each other, and they'll just have to wait outside until Morgan gets things sorted out internally. Alicia brought Virginia to Dakota's room. Dakota was highly emotional upon seeing Virginia. At this moment, Victor and the others outside began urging Morgan again. He had no choice but to walk outside once more. Alicia assured Dakota, I vouched for you and gave you a chance to stay here. If you have any ill intentions, there won't be a second chance. Inside the room, only Virginia and Dakota remained. In Dakota's heart, Virginia was the one who had killed her parents, and she had always harbored deep hatred towards her. And I'm not your sister. I'm your mother. Dakota found it hard to believe. Virginia then revealed their true identities. She explained that their previous lives hadn't been easy, and the community she built was intended to provide Dakota with a stable life. This reminded people of what Madison had done in the past. All for the sake of her children, their conflicts ran deep, and Dakota's trauma couldn't be resolved in an instant. Outside the dam, Virginia's people honored their promise, and Daniel and the others had been released. Naomi and the others from the community also arrived at the scene. Before long, Morgan and his group returned to the gate. Victor and Sherry were naturally concerned about why Virginia hadn't come out. Morgan proposed a peace treaty, saying, We should put an end to the bloodshed, let Virginia live with her guilt and remorse. Then, Morgan planted his axe into the ground as a symbol of the end of the era of killing. Sherry exclaimed, What right do you have to make this decision? So many people have suffered because of Virginia. She was emotional urging Morgan to hand Virginia over. At this point, even Victor believed it was time to bring this to a close. He said, Virginia has caused too much harm. The three factions shouldn't continue to clash over differences of opinion. Sherry, frustrated, left the scene, and the matter concluded in this manner. I really hope you know what you're doing, Morgan. Morgan stepped forward and said, anyone who agrees to the peace treaty we've just established is welcome to stay here and survive. There wasn't much of a reaction from the others, but the original group remained, including Grace and her companions, who had also arrived. Finally, Morgan saw the person he had longed to meet. Jacob reunited with Naomi, passing along the letter John had given him to deliver to her. Sherry said goodbye to Dwight and decided she didn't fit in. Similarly, Victor chose to leave. He had his own pursuits and invited Alicia to join him, but she declined his offer. Though Victor didn't elaborate, he hinted at an unknown, formidable enemy. When Virginia woke up again, she, like Morgan before, was awakened by the dog licking her face. The bullet had been removed. And Naomi, being a nurse, was the one who had done it. Virginia looked at Naomi gratefully. It was the second time Naomi had saved her. Morgan tells Virginia that they have decided to let her leave with Dakota, but not to let anyone see them. Virginia was overjoyed at the prospect of surviving. Since they were leaving, Naomi suggested Virginia change her clothes before they departed. They went outside to prepare to bring Dakota over. Virginia expressed her deep gratitude to Naomi, feeling that she owed her numerous apologies. Naomi responded, It's not your fault. It seems like fate is punishing me for my past. No matter where I go, with sadness in her voice, Naomi continued, I once had a daughter who fell ill. I kept her illness a secret to protect her and it ultimately led to everyone on our team turning into zombies. So, my beloved John was killed by your daughter, the one he worked so hard to protect. It's like karma coming full circle. Virginia tried to console her, saying, you're just like me, trying to protect your daughter. There's no need to blame yourself. Naomi came to a halt, unable to fathom how John's death could be taken so lightly by Virginia. She turned to Virginia and asked, even if you knew that Dakota killed Cameron, you would still choose to protect her. Wouldn't you? Virginia replied. I would do anything for her. Naomi walked over and produced a revolver. She said, This is the gun your daughter used to kill my husband. Virginia felt nervous, fearing that Naomi might do something drastic. I didn't protect my daughter after she killed someone. Naomi continued. I once asked you why Dakota killed my husband, and you claimed not to know. You were clearly lying. It's all because of you, Virginia. You allowed her to become this always way. Were. No way! And this time, Virginia is dead. Naomi, with an icy demeanor, walked outside. 
a trace of blood still visible on her face. Morgan and the others had just arrived at the entrance. Naomi puts on John's hat and strides outside. Morgan and the others saw what happened to Virginia. Dakota rushed in like a madwoman. The one person she hated was really gone. Morgan didn't know where Naomi was headed. Maybe Morgan can forgive Virginia without principle. But not Naomi. The love of her life was as light as a feather in Virginia's mouth. Enabling a child's wrongdoing was the ultimate culprit. Others watched Naomi's departure, perhaps secretly hoping for Virginia's demise. Naomi did what they wanted to do but didn't. Naomi continued her journey out of the dam. She had killed Virginia and had no intention of staying behind. You, you always were. No way! Virginia's death marks the end of her era. Within the dam, a community is taking shape. They raised poultry, researched vegetable cultivation, and due to the increasing population, people like Dwight, Wes, and others were actively involved in constructing houses. Everything seemed to be progressing in a positive direction a semblance of stability in this post-apocalyptic world. Just what people needed. Daniel, too, saw hope in this place. He actively helped manage the community, caring for Grace even more diligently due to the loss of his wife and daughter. Seeing the pregnant Grace is like seeing the sight of his wife when she was pregnant with his daughter. Until one day Charlie and Daniel, who were on duty, discovered the situation, and the armored car drove here again. Sherry and her group had just disembarked from the vehicle and coincidentally met Sarah, who had been out searching for Naomi. They exchanged pleasantries and Victor arrived just in time. The three factions were reunited once more, but this time it was due to a common concern the unknown enemy. Victor signaled his men to open a bag, revealing spray paint cans. The same group that had attacked the oil fields and used spray paint as their signature had become active again. In recent times, they had attacked several locations under Victor's control, including the former base of Sherry's team. At this moment, Morgan emerged, and Sarah informed him that Naomi didn't want to return for the time being. The three factions had gathered under Morgan's invitation, the hidden threat was formidable, and unity was the only way to confront it. Morgan invited them to come to the dam. Sherry and Victor nodded in agreement. Even though they didn't speak, there was no safer place than Morgan's dam. Morgan reiterated the one principle they must adhere to when coming here the peace treaty he had proposed. Anyone who violated it was not welcome. Their first task upon arriving at the dam was to surrender their weapons, a measure taken for the safety of those inside. Only Daniel and Morgan managed the weapons. However, a new issue arose. Grace's condition seemed worrisome, with no doctor available and Naomi absent. They couldn't be certain if it was a sign of her going into labor. They needed a fetal heart monitor, and Morgan knew where to find one. Consequently, he and Jacob set out in an armored vehicle to locate the equipment. Daily management within the dam now rested on Daniel's shoulders. It's worth mentioning that Dakota was reluctantly accepted into their group, primarily because she was just a child and also because she happened to be Virginia's sister. They hope she can provide some valuable information about the mysterious group they are dealing with. However, the information provided by Dakota didn't yield any substantial leads. During the meeting, everyone expressed different opinions regarding the recent events. Some doubted the veracity of Dakota's statements, leading to tensions among them. Sherry even directed suspicion toward Wes. As Virginia had previously believed he was responsible for the spray-painted message, the original team members naturally trusted Wes, but Luciana raised the possibility of an inside job, making it difficult to investigate. Daniel listened to the various arguments with a growing sense of frustration. They hadn't even started building their new community yet, and already suspicions were tearing them apart. Only Daniel is convinced that there are no traitors and that everything is just a suspicion. Just as tensions were escalating, a massive explosion rocked the building, causing everyone to hit the ground, even dislodging wooden boards from the ceiling. Rushing to the source of the explosion, Daniel explained that it was likely one of the bombs they had buried to clear the dam's entrance. It had been triggered, possibly by falling rocks from the nearby mountains. Luciana cautioned against assuming it was an accident, drawing everyone's attention to Dakota. Dakota quickly protested her innocence, claiming she had been in the meeting room when the explosion occurred. Despite Daniel's continued belief that it was an accident and the need to work together to build their new community, most of the group began to suspect an insider was responsible for the incident. Only Daniel remained steadfast in his belief that it was an accident and that they should focus on building rather than suspicion. However, Due to the explosion's loud noise, it attracted a horde of zombies to the dam's entrance. Sherry shouted for Daniel to open the armory doors, but he remained hesitant to release the weapons. Instead, Daniel believed they could hold off the zombies by sealing the breach. Morgan will be back soon with the armored car. The wall will hold. Even though Daniel said so, 
he still secretly opened the armory and prepared to take out some weapons just in case. When it comes to dealing with zombies, there is no room for complacency. It was only when Daniel opened the armory that he realized the explosion might not have been an accident after all. All the firearms had been stolen, indicating that someone had intentionally trapped them inside and lured zombies to their location. They had underestimated the number of zombies drawn by the explosion, and their situation grew dire as internal suspicions mixed with the external zombie threat. In the midst of this crisis, Daniel made it a priority to ensure the safety of Charlie and Grace, the two individuals he cared about most in this place. He directed them to temporarily leave through a smaller path leading to a secure fishing cabin nearby. He provided them with a map, and in Charlie's bag, some essentials and a first aid kit. After Charlie and Grace had left, the zombies had already gathered at the perimeter fence. Some had even made their way into the passage and reached the meeting room. The few individuals inside were puzzled as to how the zombies had breached their defenses. Considering they had two lines of defense at the entrance, they do not have time to think too much to solve the zombies is the first problem. Luciana, lacking any weapons, resorted to hurling a nearby gas canister at the zombies. But it proved ineffective in causing any harm. Wes used a long rod to dispatch one of the zombies. While Dwight, wielding a saw, managed to strike a zombie in the face. Dwight was tackled by the zombie because of the softness of the saw. Sarah was struggling with the zombies with a chair. But Raleigh came and kicked the zombie to death. Dwight, still struggling, soon had another zombie closing in on him. Everyone was perplexed because all the firearms had supposedly been stolen. It was Victor who fired the shot. Daniel said behind Victor, It's you! I put the zombies in here on purpose to find out who stole the guns. Victor was quickly detained, and Daniel demanded to know who had given Victor something in return and where the remaining weapons were hidden. Victor claimed ignorance, saying he didn't know who they were and that he had simply brought in a gun in violation of the rules. He argued that not bringing them might have resulted in the deaths of those outside. But in Daniel's mind, it was Victor who did it. He was a liar and a double dealer. Just then, shouts were heard from outside, signaling that the zombies had breached the first defensive barrier and were approaching the passageway. Fortunately, there was a second line of defense within the passageway. However, if the zombies from behind continued to accumulate, this door would soon become overwhelmed. The outside zombie threat remained unresolved. An internal discord began to brew. Sherry says Dwight knows you, but I don't. Maybe this is just a trick to keep us here. As the number of zombies increased, Daniel realized that finding the weapons was imperative. The only breakthrough point seemed to be Victor. Daniel said sternly, no more shenanigans. Victor, where are the weapons? Otherwise, I'll put a bullet in your face. Just like you did to me back then, you have no idea the pain you inflicted upon me. He then placed his fingers into his own mouth and retrieved a porcelain fragment. His right cheek and jaw were missing entirely a result of the injury Victor had inflicted on him. Daniel continued, Even sipping water makes my face convulse. I'll have to drink soup for the rest of my life. I'll never forget who did this to me. Now, tell me, where are the weapons? Victor finally grasped the magnitude of the harm he had inflicted on Daniel. He begged for forgiveness, pleading with Daniel to forgive him. Daniel was at the end of his tether, and just as he was about to pull the trigger he was interrupted by a hail of gunfire from outside the door. He rushed out to investigate, finding a scene of carnage with bodies strewn about and thick smoke obscuring the area. Once the smoke cleared, Morgan and Jacob returned, having used their armored vehicle to mow down the zombies at the entrance. With Morgan's return, it seemed that leadership was back on track. After the zombies are out of the way Morgan goes to the fishing lodge to pick up Grace. Daniel mobilized everyone to search for the missing weapons and then returned to the area where Victor was held captive. Victor, too wanted the weapons to be found quickly to clear his name. At that moment, Morgan contacted Daniel through the radio, reporting that he was at the fishing cabin but couldn't find Grace and Charlie there. Daniel was also perplexed because, logically, they should have already reached the cabin. If anything happened to Grace and Charlie, Daniel would feel guilty for the rest of his life. Soon, Daniel joined the search in the woods. Morgan said no one had been in the cabin for months, and Grace and Charlie were nowhere to be found. Luckily, Grace's voice came out of the walkie-talkie. Morgan and the others soon found Grace and Charlie. Sarah began examining Grace, while Daniel expressed his confusion about their destination. Daniel said I told you to go to the fishing lodge. Why did you come here? Grace was puzzled what cabin what are you talking about? Daniel went on to say that the cabin was in the woods and that I had marked it for you. Morgan looked at Daniel in confusion. Grace was puzzled and said, 
You told us to stay away from the cabin because you said it wasn't safe. You instructed us to go to a cave. Daniel was even more confused he told them to go to the cabin how could it be a cave? She even showed Daniel the map, which indeed indicated a cave as their destination. Charlie also confirmed that Daniel had directed them to the cave, and she produced the map which clearly showed the cave marked as the destination. Everyone was puzzled. Could it be that Daniel was old and remembered it wrong? Luciana contacted Morgan, revealing that they had found the missing weapons. She didn't disclose their location but instructed Morgan to return to the community to investigate further. Surprisingly, the weapons were discovered inside Daniel's house, and he claimed to have no knowledge of how they got there. Daniel suspected foul play and suggested that someone was framing him. However, considering the Grace incident, it seemed more than coincidental. Morgan asked Daniel how he was feeling, concerned for his mental state. Daniel couldn't remember these actions, but he couldn't rule out the possibility that he had done them. For a time after his wife's death, he had hallucinations. Naomi, who had been informed of the situation, arrived to conduct a series of psychological tests on Daniel. Fortunately, the tests indicated that Daniel did not suffer from a mental illness. Naomi believed that Daniel might have developed a psychological condition due to the constant stress and instability of the post-apocalyptic world. He had been on high alert, always worried about potential problems, and now that he was in a relatively stable environment, his mind might be struggling to adapt. After all, Naomi is not a professional. She needs to check the books to understand the treatment method. After Daniel's episode, Victor and Sherry realized that staying in their current location might not be as safe as they had thought. Just as they were preparing to leave, Dakota offered her assistance, saying, Maybe I can help. She explained that she had been reflecting on how Virginia dealt with the mysterious group. Virginia had sent her people to search for these mysterious individuals and, from the oil field, they had headed south for two days to reach a small town. Dwight says the town's name is Dallas the same plague building he and Althea went to. Morgan suggested that they start their investigation there. Luciana volunteered to help, saying that Althea and Alicia should be on their way back. She and Wes could find them and join forces for the investigation. Morgan agreed to this plan, as they were the four youngest and most experienced members. Afterward, Daniel prepared to leave, leading his horse. Charlie followed him, and Daniel explained, I have to leave. It's not safe for me to stay here. Morgan stepped out of the door at this time as well and reassured Daniel. After today, no one will do anything to you. Daniel clarified that he wasn't worried about himself but about everyone else. He confessed to having let the zombies in. If Morgan hadn't returned, he might have killed Victor and put Grace and Charlie in danger. Daniel was filled with guilt, choking up as he spoke. This elderly man only wanted to contribute to the community and build a better place for everyone. At the moment he felt so guilty that he was afraid he'd stay and do something to endanger everyone. The last time he faced a similar situation, he had burned down the estate. Charlie asked Daniel where he was planning to go, and he replied, I'll return to that warehouse. If it's no longer there, I'll find another place. As they were about to leave, Victor unexpectedly invited Daniel to go with him. This puzzled Daniel considering he had nearly killed Victor. Victor explained that his offer was not for Daniel, but for his daughter. She wished for Daniel to live a peaceful and stable life. Daniel accepts Victor's invitation to say goodbye to Morgan and Charlie. This is a mysterious organization that uses zombies as fertilizer. They successfully cultivated precious fresh vegetables by mixing zombies with soil. This place is a renovated basement with electricity and water supply and the whole hall is playing brainwashing theoretical audio. Every member is busy with their own work. Besides vegetables, they also breed hens, which are their source of food. They combine vegetables and eggs to make delicious egg pizzas. A new woman receives the food and prepares to deliver it to the designated place. Suddenly, she stops and stares at a zombie in front of her, trying to decipher something. Watching this zombie is a spiritual belief of the organization. Every new member must observe it. Only those who understand its essence are truly recognized. Then, a man comes over, claiming that a new member has joined and they need to welcome them. The woman is curious about who the newcomer is. Jason said the patrols saved them from the zombies. Boss Teddy said they were having a rough time of it. After the elevator doors open, the new members turn out to be Luciana and three others who came to investigate the mysterious person. They had just arrived in Dallas town and encountered zombies, after which they were brought here. Jason assures them not to be nervous and that they can boldly come out as they won't be harmed. Alicia then leads the way out of the elevator, and they curiously observe the basement. It seems like people are living comfortably, with some even playing chess and mahjong. Wes, puzzled 
wonders if this is the mysterious organization, their doubts are soon confirmed by a painting on the wall that reads, the end is the beginning, Wes, who loves painting, suddenly feels a strange familiarity with this painting, Jason puts in a cassette and starts a recorder, to Alicia's confusion, Jason explains it's for Teddy, as he is the reason they can live here and is always with them, Alicia curiously asks if Teddy is dead, to which Jason says not to overthink it as he's still alive and they are lucky to be found by them, apart from Alicia, others are also individually questioned about where they come from, after the plague building and oil field incidents, they would never reveal the location of the dam, Jason always mentions a person named Teddy, who seems like a savior in his description, he then shows them the vegetable cultivation and the zombie decomposition process, Jason said it takes months to decompose a zombie, and the flesh is used to grow vegetables and the bones are used to feed chickens, Alicia wonders how they can eat such food, Jason brainwashes her by explaining the laws of nature, Althea is puzzled about what all their actions are preparing for, Jason reveals that they arrived just in time as they are preparing to close the door forever, Alicia is shocked by the idea of living underground forever, Jason says this way, they can stay underground forever, which is the new way of survival, and life will reproduce underground, they can't understand these people's thinking, Jason then takes Alicia and others to see their faith, he asks Alicia to look carefully and tell him what she sees, on their territory, Alicia can only pretend to observe and says she sees a zombie that should be buried in the ground, Jason is obviously dissatisfied with her answer, as they hope newcomers see what Teddy saw to be approved by him, essentially brainwashing, unsurprisingly, Luciana, Althea, and Wes also see nothing special, after a brief contact, they find out that all new members are brainwashed by them, the only information they get is that they seem to be preparing for some big plan, to find out more, they can only win Teddy's trust, as they were discussing their plans, the people around them began to act hastily, Jason said that the others had returned, and it was time for them to meet Teddy, soon, everyone at the elevator is waiting to welcome their spiritual leader, Teddy, they are also very curious about what kind of person can brainwash so many people, the lift door slowly opened and out came a man with a different aura than they expected. I'm starving. <laughs> Where's Teddy? Obviously this man is not Teddy. The man simply says that Teddy let them come back first and will arrive later. No one notices the tears in Wes's eyes as he recognizes the speaker as his brother Derek. Wes, tearfully, approaches Derek, calling his name. Derek is also surprised to see Wes here. They are brothers. And Wes has always thought Derek died while searching for food. They can't believe their luck that they are both still alive. Even Wes's painting skills were taught by Derek. They sit together and explain what happened during this time. Derek said that when he went out to find food, he encountered zombies and was saved by the people here. When he went to find Wes, Wes was no longer at the original place. Overall, the fact that Derek is still alive is a wonderful thing. Wes also asked if Derek painted the words on the wall. Derek probably said he helps people see what he sees. The graffiti they left on tree trunks in the past, although encouraging, was meaningless. Now, Teddy has helped him see different things, making his actions meaningful. Wes realized something was off with his brother and asked what exactly he was doing here. Derek, thoughtful and not answering directly, stood up and said that Wes was not ready yet. When Wes can see on the zombies what Derek sees, then he will truly be ready. Then Derek had to go on duty. Luciana approached Wes, cautioning him to be careful, but Wes firmly believed his brother would not harm him. Luciana reminded him about the oil field incident, where many were killed and Wes was severely injured and nearly died. Wes consoled himself, believing Derek was unaware of those events. Knowing Derek, he was too kind to do such things. After a day's work, it was finally dinner time. Alicia felt the people here were very abnormal, as if they had entered a pyramid scheme organization. Wes because of his brother's presence, wondered if the people here might not be bad, and the plague and oilfield incidents were just targeted at Virginia, the others, however, did not agree with his view, at this time, Derek also came over to greet them, Althea could only respond with a forced smile, but soon, Jason came to signal Derek that they had something to do and needed to go to the surface to handle some matters, it seemed that Derek held a high position here, after they left, Althea suggested that Wes take them to Derek's place to see if they could find something. What the hell was that? You know where Derek's bunk is? Under Wes's lead, Althea rummaged through Derek's room, finding nothing but paints. Eventually, Wes discovered something in a jar. Althea recognized the booklet she found. It belonged to her girlfriend's mysterious organization. She began to worry about her girlfriend's safety, 
Fearing the people here had already attacked them, they also found a map marked with Virginia's community, the oil field, and the building, but Wes still refused to believe his brother was involved in such deeds. However, a notebook Althea found left Wes speechless, it detailed every outpost in the area and even had daily records of personnel movements at the oil field. It seemed they had been tracking them for a long time. Wes, heartbroken, believed his brother was misled and resolved to take him away from here. At the moment Derek is still painting the mural with images of where they attacked. Wes found Derek and said bluntly, You did all this, didn't you? Derek was obviously stunned. Those places were all attacked by you, why did you do it? Derek, realizing he could no longer hide the truth, boldly admitted, You can't understand what I'm doing right now, but it's okay. I couldn't see myself clearly either until I met Teddy. And Wes got angry and said, He's the one who brainwashed you into thinking that killing was right. I was in an oil field and I was hit by debris from an explosion. I've never been in more pain in my life and I almost lost my life. Derek showed no remorse, insisting it was what Teddy wanted. Wes exclaimed loudly, I don't care about Teddy or what he represents. Why have you become like this? You've killed so many people. They were good, innocent people. How could you be so heartless to kill them? I know you. This isn't the real you. Come with us. Where I am is a good place. Morgan won't be like Teddy, he won't force you to do anything you don't want to. Derek appeared visibly surprised upon hearing Morgan's name, followed by confusion. Isn't Virginia ruling that area? He asked. Wes informed him that Virginia was dead and Morgan had overthrown her. Then Derek began to inquire about the location of Morgan's base. Wes, wisely, did not reveal the dam's location. Instead, he simply asked Derek, will you come with us? Clearly moved by Wes's words. Derek decided to take the risk and leave with them, taking advantage of the lack of surveillance. They quietly entered the elevator. However, Alicia remained cautious of Derek, questioning what was in his backpack. Derek revealed it contained maps and coordinates of their next target, insisting that taking these materials would prevent harm to others. As the elevator doors opened, Alicia suddenly elbowed Derek and seized his gun. She was unwilling to take the risk of bringing Derek back, not after being deceived by Dakota, Wes insisted on staying with his brother, arguing that just because Dakota deceived them, it didn't mean his brother would do the same. Alicia argued that they couldn't take the risk, suggesting they return first and then come back for Derek. They needed to leave quickly, but as Alicia turned around, Jason was already waiting for them. They were taken to a strange room, resembling a human experimentation lab, which was quite unsettling. Who knows what they're in for? Althea immediately recognized the equipment as embalming devices. Jason said you'll never rot. You just won't be able to return to dust. Because of your actions, you will not be a part of our operation. Tell us where we can find Morgan Jones. Alicia was puzzled about how they knew Morgan's name. Jason, without responding to Alicia's question, demanded to know the location of their base. He had been investigating for a long time and knew it wasn't in Virginia's stronghold. Seeing their reluctance to speak, Jason, infuriated, prepared to use Wes as his first victim. Their equipment was designed to extract human blood and then inject it with a preservative. At that moment, Derek arrived. He urged Wes to answer, threatening to kill him if he didn't comply. It was clear to them that Derek had betrayed them. This group had been actively searching for Morgan, as they were the same people who previously attempted to take the key from him. Derek declared his unwillingness to leave, emphasizing the importance of their work. He insisted that Wes should stay and witness the truth for himself. Derek then says he's going to give Wes one last chance to see the zombies again, and if Wes sees it, he'll understand them. The brothers stood before the zombie, and Derek asked Wes what he saw. Wes rhetorically asks Derek if they knew he was there when they attacked the oil field. Derek didn't answer that question. He just said that people are people, and all he cared about now was what Wes saw. No longer holding out any hope for his brother, Wes says he sees a man who is just like a zombie. A man who can still walk with a rotting heart. Derek seemed pleased with this response, but Wes clarified, I'm not talking about myself. Wes then tried to take Derek's gun, leading to a struggle. Derek pointed the gun at Wes, showing he no longer cared about their brotherly bond. Wes, in the face of death, explodes with energy and pushes Derek into the zombies. And so Derek was not on by their faith. Wes was heartbroken, but there was nothing he could do. Derek is beyond help, heartbroken but resolute. Wes shot Derek to prevent him from turning into a zombie, hearing the gunshot. Those in the room realized something was amiss. Jason ordered his men to deal with Alicia and the others. The moment Jason opened the door, 
Wes immediately held him at gunpoint with a gun. Seeing the bloodstains on Wes's hands, they could easily infer what had transpired. Wes ordered Jason's subordinates to back off, but they clearly had no intention of leaving. Althea had no choice but to open a passageway behind them, and they quickly hid inside. They got an axe and wedged it in the doorway, hoping it would hold them off for a while. When Althea turned on the flashlight and shone it forward, a chilling sensation instantly swept over them. They swore it was the most terrifying sight they had ever seen in their lives. Inside the room, there were countless zombies hanging densely from the ceiling. The reason there were no growling noises from the zombies was that their mouths had been stitched shut, and it appeared they had been treated with preservatives to prevent decay. Althea said, the zombies' mouths have been sewn shut. So if we move quickly, we can get through. Once we're out of this room, we'll be in the underground parking lot. The door behind them wouldn't hold much longer. Despite knowing the zombies' mouths were stitched, they were still incredibly tense. As if living through a nightmare, Althea, holding the flashlight, was last in line, passing the last row. She spotted the uniform of her girlfriend's organization. Her heart raced with anxiety, praying it wasn't her girlfriend. Luciana noticed Althea's hesitation and urged her to hurry. With a trembling heart, Althea lifted the helmet visor of the uniformed figure, revealing a pale face. Thankfully not her girlfriend's, just as she sighed in relief. The zombies burst its stitched mouth open. Alicia, with quick reflexes, pierced the zombie's skull. Instead of blood, green liquid flowed from its wound. Meanwhile, the door was about to be breached. Luciana and Wes were trying to break through another door to escape. They needed to buy some time. Alicia suggested they needed to destroy the place. Althea mentioned that the preservative was flammable and could be used to ignite the room. And she had matches. Taking the matches, Alicia insisted on staying behind to set the fire and buy them time. She urged the others to leave and deliver the map to Morgan, assuring she would find a way to escape. Without further delay, Wes walked out. Alicia began inflicting wounds on the zombies to spread the preservative throughout the room. The pursuers were almost through the door. The preservative had almost covered the entire room, even spilling outside. Alicia lit the match in her hand, just as her mother had done years ago, dropping the flame at the moment someone entered the door. Instantly, the fire spread throughout the entire room. Wes and his team quickly brought the intelligence they had gathered to Morgan. When they emerged, they saw only a sky filled with fire and people scattering in every direction. Alicia might have escaped as well. This was their first close encounter with that mysterious group, narrowly escaping becoming their fertilizer. But their ultimate goal remained unknown. From Althea, they learned that this group was searching for Morgan. But even Morgan didn't understand why. Now, their urgent task was to find Alicia. They decided to send people to search near the parking lot. Unknown to them, Alicia, after starting the fire, had been captured by the holdings people and was locked in the room previously used for processing corpses. With the door jammed, Alicia quickly looked for some weapons to defend herself. Soon, someone opened the door and in came Harvey and Jason. Alicia asked them what they planned to do with her. Jason said that the zombies she burned were their future fertilizer, and they intended to turn her into the same to atone for her sins. Then, Jason signaled Harvey to deal with Alicia and left the room. In their eyes, Alicia was just a weak woman, an easy target for Harvey. He didn't even look at Alicia but instead started up the machine. Harvey said it would be less painful if she cooperated, and he rather gentlemanly asked Alicia to lie down on the operating table. Unmoved, Alicia remained still, losing patience. Harvey prepared to take action himself. Seizing the moment, Alicia tried to escape, but the door was already locked from the outside. Harvey adjusts and flips Alicia to the ground again, followed by a kick to the stomach, before Alicia could catch her breath. Harvey lunged at her with his weapon. Luckily, Alicia dodged the attack and pressed on Harvey's injured eye. Taking advantage of Harvey's momentary pain, Alicia kicked him away and grabbed a machine syringe from the table. As soon as the needle plunged in, Harvey lost his ability to move. His blood began to flow into the tube, and within 30 seconds, Harvey lay motionless on the floor. His death was gruesome. His blood drained and replaced with preservatives. Alicia, having suffered internal injuries from Harvey's kicks, was now in a weakened state. The door opened again, and Jason entered, furious at the sight of Harvey on the floor. Another man accompanying Jason stabbed Harvey's head with a knife to prevent him from turning into a zombie. The man then asked Jason to leave, wanting to speak with Alicia alone. Despite her exhaustion, Alicia confidently said, It seems you're the leader of this crazy group, Teddy, an apparently wise old man, knew Alicia by name, suggesting Jason had already briefed him about her. He told Alicia, Don't be nervous, if I wanted to kill you, 
we wouldn't be having this conversation, we have much to learn from each other. Alicia was not interested in Teddy's brainwashing, she retorted, cut the nonsense, you can't kill me, I'll fight to the end, Teddy, slightly angered, said, you and your friends destroyed everything we worked hard for, years of effort, you ruined it, no one else will forgive you, but I believe you are a warrior, every ending is a beginning, he continued, but Alicia didn't understand what he meant, Teddy got straight to the point, I want to save you, Alicia, Alicia laughed mockingly, I don't need your salvation, Teddy smiled, I know you don't believe in all this, in us, but you will, I've always been looking for someone like you, meanwhile, Morgan was unaware that Alicia had been captured, and it seemed that there was also trouble with Grace. In the post-apocalyptic world, leisurely and picturesque scenes were rare. At the moment, Grace is enjoying the serenity of nature, hearing a sound. Grace opened her eyes to see a zombie lunging at her. She struggled to prevent the zombie from biting her and finally managed to break its arm, giving herself a chance to breathe. Just then, a stick pierced through the zombie's head, pushing the creature away and gasping for air. Grace saw a young girl with a long stick, standing up. Grace realized her pregnant belly was gone. Was this all a dream? Or was she dreaming now? As more zombies approached from a distance, the girl told Grace not to move, assuring her she could handle it. The girl faced the zombies without panic, wielding her long stick with ease. Grace watched, puzzled as her skill with the stick was strikingly similar to Morgan's. The zombies stood no chance against her. The girl, named Athena, helped Grace up and revealed that her father had taught her these skills. She was planning to take Grace back to their base for a medical checkup. They walked through a path lined with pink plants, which looked particularly warm and inviting. When they arrived at the girl's home, Grace realized it was the dam. Curious. Grace asked the girl how old she was. Athena replied, I'm 16 this year. I've been here since I was born. Grace was puzzled, as the dam was only built a few months ago. Looking around, she noticed significant differences from before. The only unchanged item was the axe Morgan had left there. Now rusted, Grace couldn't help but reminisce about her moments with Morgan. Then she saw Athena's father, Morgan, with white hair. Grace excitedly called out to Morgan. Morgan, not recognizing Grace at that moment, still led her into the dam. The dam had improved a lot. Now housing livestock and various crops, Grace revealed her identity to Morgan, whose expression turned serious. Grace had to reveal a secret only known to them. Although Morgan was still confused, he was convinced that she was Grace. And then he showed Grace her grave. Morgan revealed that he had personally buried her. Grace curiously asked how she had died. Morgan explained, childbirth weakened you, and the radiation you had been exposed to was beyond belief. It was clear Athena was her child. But Grace chose not to acknowledge their relationship. The whole situation was bewildering. Morgan, unsure why another Grace had appeared, tried to accept it. Grace then saw Naomi, now nearly 60, self-trained as a doctor, with her apprentice Charlie. However, they didn't recognize the current Grace. And of course there was Daniel in his 70s who was cutting Victor's hair and it looked like they had made up. Dwight appeared next, with his mischievous son and wife, who held their daughter, Sherry had let go of her past grievances to live happily with Dwight. Morgan mentioned Alicia had returned to the initial stadium, and Althea was out searching for her girlfriend. Everyone seemed to be leading the life Grace had always hoped for. Morgan then wanted to take the mother and daughter for a walk. Even though Athena didn't know about their relationship, as they walked, a car appeared ahead with the word end written on it. Grace felt an eerie familiarity with the vehicle, as if remembering something. In her excitement, she touched the car's door handle triggering an explosion that hurled Grace away. In the coma Grace's mind floated a lot of scenes also heard Morgan has been calling her. When she awoke, Morgan was gone, and zombies were approaching, but Athena remained. They quickly left the area, with Morgan's calls still echoing, heard only by Grace. She responded to the sky, informing him of their location, but his calls persisted. Grace, looking at the zombies, remembered what had happened. She was about to give birth, and the only medical help. Naomi, was kilometers away, Morgan was taking her to Naomi's hospital when the car exploded in reality, she realized she must be in a coma, with Morgan continuously calling out to her, indeed, at this moment, Grace was unconscious, able to hear Morgan's calls but unable to wake up, Morgan pleaded, I need you to wake up and have the baby, please, Grace, wake up, outside, numerous zombies had gathered, the explosion wasn't an accident, but the work of a mysterious group, Morgan reached for his walkie-talkie to contact Naomi, informing her they were at the veterinary station by the 28-kilometer marker. 
but Naomi said she was still five hours away. Their only hope now was to get Grace to wake up, as the child was also in danger. In her dream, Grace was equally anxious. Hearing Naomi's words, she thought that reaching the veterinary station in her dream might wake her up. As she neared the station, Morgan's voice became clearer, confirming her theory. She believed that once she reached there, she would wake up. Just then, Grace suddenly fell to the ground in pain, and Athena displayed similar symptoms. This was due to Morgan moving Grace in the real world. Fortunately, Morgan found a safe place to stop. Grace pulled Athena up and she felt the same way she did. Even though it was a dream, the feeling of mother and son connecting transcended time and space. And in the dream she was a real person. Grace explained the situation to Athena. I need to wake up for you to be born. On their way, they encountered a white horse, bringing joy even in the dreamlike setting. In reality, the people outside seemed to have discovered their position and Morgan had to go out to fight. In the dream, Grace reached the veterinary station. Five men confronted Morgan. Morgan warned. You should turn around and leave now. Jason says give us your keys and we'll be fine. We've been looking for you for a long time. Unintimidated. Morgan replied. Leave now. Or meet the same fate as the last two. Jason insisted the keys could change everything. Seeing Jason unheeding, Morgan prepared for a fight. Jason was going to fight himself. But he was stopped by his man who thought it would be easy for them to fight five against one. But the situation unfolded in unexpected ways. Originally, Morgan intended only to injure them, not to kill. But when they refused to back down, he had no choice but to comply with their persistence. It took him just two minutes to deal with four of them. The remaining one, Jason, showed no sign of surrender. But Morgan swiftly pierced his chest with a single move. Jason's injury wasn't fatal, and he chose to flee. At this time, Grace had stopped breathing and Morgan desperately performed chest compressions. In the dream, Athena was surrounded by zombies while Grace lay weak on the ground. In the final moments, an older Morgan arrived. He helped Grace to her feet. In front of them was a door of light. Stepping through it would awaken Grace. As much as she hates to leave her 16-year-old daughter, the real world Morgan is waiting for her. After stepping through the light, Grace in the real world finally woke up. I'm going to have a daughter. Grace exclaimed joyfully. Morgan decided to name her Athena, as Grace had been calling out this name in her coma. As Grace and Morgan discussed the dream, a car noise came from outside. The next thing you know, a car comes crashing in, and the man who comes down is Jason. Jason, armed with a gun, crashed into the place, aiming for the key around Morgan's neck. For the sake of Grace's safety, although he didn't know what they wanted the key for, Morgan still gave it to Jason, thankfully. Jason kept his word and left in his car. Unable to wait for Naomi to arrive for the delivery, Morgan took on the task. After hours of struggle, the child was finally born, but Morgan's smile froze. Grace sensed something was wrong. The baby wasn't crying. She kept calling out to Morgan. With no other option, Morgan turned around, holding the baby. Grace took the baby, expecting her to be like Athena from her dream, only to face a tragic outcome, though not Morgan's child. The loss of a new life deeply pained him. <laughs> Alicia was captured by the mysterious group while covering for Althea and others during their retreat. Their leader, Teddy, admired Alicia and planned to persuade her to join him. Meanwhile, they dispatched Jason to seize the key Morgan had obtained, inadvertently involving Grace. Additionally, due to the long distance traveled by Naomi, the medical personnel, Grace's child was born without breath. The next day, Concerned Naomi arrived at the dam to check on Grace, but Morgan stopped her. Morgan said that Grace had locked herself in the church. Praying daily, she felt that her child bore her sins. Morgan was also angry, wondering if things would have been different if Naomi had stayed at the dam. He wouldn't allow Naomi in now, arguing her presence would only upset Grace. Morgan believed Naomi's visit was more about alleviating her own guilt than helping Grace. Obviously, Morgan's words hurt Naomi's heart, and she could only turn around and leave. After leaving, Naomi didn't go back to the hospital, but went to the original oil field. There, she found the same message spray-painted. The end is the beginning. Naomi wanted to find clues from the place where the mysterious man appeared. She was going to avenge Grace in her own way and to prevent more people from being hurt. She then remembered a letter from John she had never read, fearing it would overwhelm her with sadness. At that moment, Dwight arrived, concerned about Naomi who had recently dealt with John's loss and now Grace's child's death. 
Dwight felt that Naomi must have felt very sorry for herself and that he was worried about her. Dwight was grateful to John and Naomi for their support during his most challenging times. Without them, he feared he might have lost his will to live. Naomi felt deeply guilty, thinking if she hadn't saved Virginia at the oil fields, John might still be alive. Sherry, Dwight's wife, also arrived at the scene, hoping to find some gasoline. At that moment, Naomi asked, did you bring anyone else with you? They quickly took cover behind the car. It seemed they had encountered an attack, possibly from one of the mysterious group members. Naomi, undaunted and even excited, told Sherry they should try to capture the attacker alive, as he might have valuable information. She then kicked off the car's rearview mirror to try to spot the attacker, underestimating the man's shooting skills. Sherry could not care less about capturing him alive. She took out her pistol and fired three shots to scare the man away. The gunfire attracted several zombies towards them. Naomi instructed them to stay and fight off the zombies while she checked if the man was dead or alive. She was keen to find out the location of the mysterious group to prevent further harm. Upon reaching the spot, the man was gone, but a bus was parked there, likely belonging to their attacker. Naomi approached the bus cautiously, but the door was locked and she couldn't open it, so she had to force the window to break. She puts her clothes on the window. Naomi wants to go in and see if she can find any clues. Inside, she found a hand-cranked spotlight and discovered a map on the bus wall with photos of the spray-painted slogans. The photos indicated the attacker had visited many locations marked with the slogans, suggesting a deep connection with the group. Suddenly, she heard the sound of a gun being cocked and turned to find the old man who had attacked them. He questioned her presence and affiliation with the spray painters. Naomi realizes that this man is not part of that organization and suggests that they could join forces against them. The old man just said that you and your companion should leave. These people are very perverted and not something that you can imagine. Naomi, fearless, was more interested in the information the old man had. He revealed that since a garage fire, he hadn't been able to locate them, warning that if they discovered Naomi's group searching for them, they'd quickly execute their plan. Without disclosing the plan, the man, who had been tracking the group for a long time, refused to share more information. In order to get some information from the old man, Naomi said there's one more place you missed on this map. The man, uninterested in exchanging information, instead ordered Naomi at gunpoint to drive him somewhere, with no choice. Naomi had to leave Dwight and Sherry behind, looking at the old man pointing a gun at her. Naomi said that it's not necessary, I want to deal with them as much as you do. The stubborn old man wasn't buying it, so Naomi took a risky move, suddenly swerving the car, causing him to lose his balance. The car skidded for 20 meters before stopping at the roadside. Seizing the opportunity, Naomi drew her gun on the old man. At the sight of the pistol, the old man froze for a moment. Then he asked Naomi where she got the pistol from. Naomi retorted, asking why she should tell him. He revealed the gun was his, identified by the initials JD on the handle, his name being John Dory. Naomi realized this was John's father, who had left when John was very young, so much so that John thought he was dead. Naomi's manner and tone of voice began to change for the better. Dory was her husband's father after all. Naomi asked him why he didn't ask John where he was and how he'd spent the last 40 years. Dory said he already knew the answer. Naomi's presence there, her sorrowful expression, John's service gun with her, and the two wedding rings she wore, as a former police officer, he could put these clues together. Naomi then realized she had left her coat on the bus window. When she checked, the coat, containing John's letter, was gone, likely fallen onto the road. She wanted to go back for it, but Dory refused to waste gasoline. Naomi tried to start the car in protest, but it wouldn't move. Upon inspection, she realized that they had accidentally run over a zombie, getting it stuck under the car. Naomi learned some secrets from Dory. When Dory was a police officer, a pastor named Teddy went mad and committed murder. To incarcerate Teddy, Dory resorted to framing him. Since the 70s, Teddy had been preaching the idea that the end is the beginning. A few months ago, he was out looking for food and found this message spray-painted elsewhere. He rushed back to the prison hoping to find Teddy's body. However, Teddy's cell was open, indicating he was causing trouble again in this post-apocalyptic world. Dory used dishonorable methods to capture Teddy, and although hailed as a hero, he couldn't face himself for it. He chose to leave John and his mother, too ashamed to see them or visit their cabin again. Naomi then remembered something about that cabin. After Virginia's death, her henchman Hill disappeared, likely hiding there. John's other pistol is still in Hill's possession and he may know more about the organization. They decided to walk to the cabin. Shortly after they left, 
Dwight and Sherry, who had tracked them, found the bus. They see the photo on the wall and realize that the old man who shot at them is John's father, so they're most likely heading to the cabin. Sherry marveled at the twists of fate. Dwight reflected on how he had once attacked John, but John not only helped him later but also led him back to Sherry, a true wonder of fate. A zombie with its mouth sewn shut staggered towards them, and a man rushed forward, plunging a knife into the zombie's skull. It was Dory and Naomi, heading to the cabin. Dory commented that this was clearly Teddy's handiwork, as the preservative oozing from the zombie's wounds was Teddy's signature method of killing before the apocalypse. As they journeyed, Naomi learned more about Teddy from Dory. Teddy was a psychologically twisted and abnormal individual, often speaking about destruction and rebirth. Along the way, Naomi noticed the cut on Dolly's hand and grabbed some medical supplies from the shop. Dory mentioned that there were writings on the wall left by John as a child in the room, and Naomi naturally wanted to see. However, as soon as Naomi entered the house, Dory locked her in. Confused, Naomi questioned his intentions. Dory explained that she was his son's wife and the closest thing to family he had left. He couldn't let her take risks, Naomi retorted, asking if he was abandoning her like he did John. Before she could say more, Dory had already left. Dory didn't want Naomi to risk going to the cabin because he knew Hill was dangerous. Meanwhile, Dwight and Sherry were riding horses frantically until Sherry's horse collapsed from exhaustion and had to be shot by Sherry. Dwight felt his wife had changed, becoming unrecognizable. He wanted to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her. Sherry revealed her inner thoughts. She had no grudge against Virginia or the mysterious group with the spray-painted slogans. Sherry sought out Dwight this time, intending to properly say goodbye. Sherry's experience on the Saviors has been very traumatic. The shadow cast by Negan was too great, and she wanted to say goodbye to Dwight and return to Virginia to confront and eliminate Negan. Otherwise, she felt she would live under his shadow for the rest of her life. Dwight, understanding her turmoil as he had once felt similarly, agreed to help her. He promised to find Naomi first and then assist Sherry in getting a car to return to Virginia. Sherry calmed down and accepted Dwight's proposal. Together, they rode on a single horse towards the cabin and soon reached a bridge strewn with corpses the same place where Dakota had fatally shot John. While they were talking, they heard knocking and shouting from a distance. The source of the noise was Naomi, locked inside the store. Meanwhile, Dory arrived at the cabin he had long feared to return to, now in disarray. Yet many items still remained as they were 30 years ago. Despite appearing calm, his guilt over his son was immense. Even pretending to be indifferent about his son's death, he became alert upon seeing leftover fish in a pot, suspecting Hill might be there. As Dory was inspecting the area, a zombie approached him. He quickly repelled him with his knife, but was met by a bearded man with a gun hill. After Virginia's death, he has been hiding here because the enemies they made before were too many. At that moment the sound of zombies came from behind and Hill's attention was distracted. Dory, though older, used his police training to overpower Hill against a tree. Demanding information about Teddy, Hill claimed to know only that their plan was big, aiming to kill everyone, but no specifics. Dory, sensing he wasn't lying, told him to pack up and leave. Hill noticed Dory's wounded hand and seized it, causing Dory pain and preventing him from shooting. They struggled and fell to the ground. But Dory managed to knock Hill down with a punch. He was about to pick up his pistol when he saw a sight that made him freeze. Dory had forgotten that there was an enemy behind him. Because he saw his son's tombstone, suddenly, a gunshot rang out. And Dory was hit in the abdomen. Hill was ready to shoot again. Dory knows that his son is no longer alive. And when he sees his son's grave, he feels a sharp pain in his heart. His vision started to blur, and the last image he saw was Naomi and two unfamiliar faces. When Dory regained consciousness, his wound had been treated. Thankfully with Naomi, a nurse, present, or he might have died there. Naomi is looking for her letter, and Dwight and Sherry happened to pick up her coat on the way. Luckily, the letter was still inside. They all felt melancholic that John, such a good man, was gone. Naomi decided to face her pain and opened the letter John had left her. Written when he planned to rescue Janice, the letter read, Naomi, this is the hardest decision I've ever made. Please forgive me for leaving you to save an innocent person. This might mean I'll never see you again, but I believe one day you'll forgive me. Just like I forgave, just like I forgave my dad. It took me years to understand why he chose to abandon me to punish a psychopath. I forgive him now. He's a good man who did what he thought was right. He loved me, just like I love you now. I miss the old days at the lodge. When you came into my life, my world lit up. You're the most incredible woman I've ever met. If I die, 
Know that being with you was the most valuable part of my life. <sighs> and a nurse named June was the light guiding my way. I love you, June Bug. Everyone was touched by John's words and Dwight felt sad for his dear friend. After this incident, Dwight found a car for Sherry, with enough gas to reach Virginia, but Sherry seemed more pensive, questioning her decision. She reflected on John's father's lifelong hunt for Teddy, which led to years of separation from his family and a wasted life. She doesn't want that to happen to her. Dwight suggested they start life anew together, if she wants to. Inspired by Dory and Naomi, Sherry realized how fortunate she was to have Dwight, her loving partner. In these uncertain times, Naomi returned the wedding rings to them, originally provided by Dwight for their marriage. Dwight had fallen into the abyss, but luckily he met John, and he will always remember the gift of rebirth. Cherish those around you, as the story implies. Finally, Naomi brought Dory back to the dam, heard that this is John's father. Morgan also gave a warm welcome. Without John, Morgan wouldn't be the man he is now. Naomi told Morgan that Dory knew a lot about Teddy's group, the same ones who attacked him and Grace. She suggested they could help each other. Then, Naomi apologized to Morgan. She had let go of her obsessions and hoped for another chance to stay. Morgan, in turn, apologized to her, admitting he had spoken in anger earlier. Dory also shared with Morgan his insights about Teddy's plans, which were almost certainly aimed at destroying everyone in the area. Now, they realized the only way forward was to unite and take down Teddy first. In the prison, a desperate plea echoed from an inmate scheduled for execution that day. Passing a cell, an old man said, Don't fear, George. Just remember, the end is the beginning. You are about to be reborn. The guards were used to the somewhat delusional old man's ramblings, with a smile on his face. This was Teddy, an unexpected serial killer before the apocalypse. Teddy has spent more than 20 years in prison, accompanied only by his mother's photo. Suddenly, an alarm sounded in the prison, and their cell doors automatically opened. There were screams from inside the prison. George, who was to be executed, stumbled into the hallway, his chest covered in blood. This was the early stage of the zombie virus outbreak. Teddy stepped out, saw the rebirth of the dead, and quietly retreated back to his cell. Zombies passed by his door, but other inmates weren't as lucky. A guard who had mocked Teddy turned into a zombie and approached him. Teddy stabbed the guard's head with a pen. Teddy was not afraid. He kept repeating, my theory is right. Just need patience. Only the end is the beginning. Thus, Teddy escaped, spreading his ideology. He made recordings of his thoughts, playing them daily in his house. Since her capture, Alicia had been listening to the broadcasts for several days, with those ideas echoing in her mind, attempting to change her thoughts. Jason visited daily, asking if Alicia was ready to accept Teddy's beliefs. The next day, Alicia sighed deeply, now able to recite the broadcast content by heart. Teddy entered, appearing kind and humorous, a stark contrast to his image as a deranged killer. He told Alicia they had found a new home, everyone packing to leave. He wanted Alicia to promise to commit sincerely to their cause. Stubbornly, Alicia flatly refused. Jason didn't want to waste any more time on Alicia, who he thought was an incapable of grasping the true meaning of the worlds. However, Teddy was very fond of Alicia, seeing Jason go against his wishes. Alicia was dumbfounded by the action. It's a move Teddy learned in prison, and it looks like it works, though Alicia hadn't agreed to join them. Teddy, patient as ever, planned to take her out with him. Jason was confused by Teddy's actions. Teddy explained that he was taking her to handle some personal matters, hoping to get to know each other better. Teddy angrily says stop questioning his decisions. Soon, a bus arrived with a group of new recruits. Young and energetic, the last person to disembark, to Alicia's surprise, was Dakota, who should have been at the dam. Alicia wondered how she had joined this organization. Their meeting was awkward. Teddy learned from their conversation that Dakota had killed Alicia's friend and even wanted to kill her own mother. This piqued Teddy's interest, and he decided to take both Dakota and Alicia out with him. Alicia was reluctant, but she had no say in the matter. So she advised Teddy that if you were smart enough, you wouldn't take Dakota. Jason also advised against taking them, fearing danger. Teddy then took the key off his neck and put it around Jason's neck and told him that if I don't come back tomorrow, you know what to do. They prepared to calm the new members. Seeing no one around, Dakota approached Alicia and said, Things are not what you think. I joined them after hearing you were captured. I've been looking for you. I'm here to help you. Alicia sternly replied, I don't want your help. 
Nor do I need it, since John's incident. Alicia harbored extreme disdain for Dakota and didn't believe a word she said. Dakota persisted. I found out some information, they have stockpiled a lot of supplies at a certain location, enough to sustain them for several years. This old man is scary but we can find a chance to kill him. Alicia firmly told Dakota to stop talking about us, asserting she would never stand with her again. Then, the seemingly benign old man, Teddy, led them on their journey. He didn't reveal the destination, but Alicia distinctly felt that Teddy intended to persuade her during this trip. Half an hour later, they arrived at a mausoleum. Teddy asked Alicia to help him pull out a coffin, and when he opened it, there was a long dead woman. Teddy affectionately addressed the corpse. Hello, mother. At that moment, Teddy seemed childlike. He mentioned that just because his mother was gone, it didn't mean she couldn't be part of the future. Next, they placed the body in the car and continued driving. Alicia, confused, asked if the purpose was just to dig up his mother's body. Teddy explained that all three of them had lost their mothers and hoped they could support him through this tough time. Through conversation, Alicia discovers that although Teddy is kind on the outside, he is very twisted on the inside. He believed his release from prison was a divine opportunity to reshape the world, thinking that only through destruction could rebirth occur. The exact means of this destruction were unclear, but it was evidently related to the key. Alicia had to pretend to pander to Teddy in order to make sense of the situation. Suddenly, the car had a flat tire, and Teddy's mother's body was thrown from the vehicle. Teddy then quickly ran over to his mother's body and hurriedly checked to see if there was anything wrong, but fortunately there was no damage. As they were putting the body back in the car, two zombies emerged from the forest. Alicia, experienced in such matters, advised Teddy not to shoot to avoid attracting more zombies. However, more zombies emerged from the nearby bushes, and the situation appeared to be out of the ordinary. Alicia resorted to using a car tool to fight off the zombies. Dakota grabbed a piece of wood to use as a weapon. Teddy is also locked in a standoff with a zombie. Soon, several zombies were killed one after the other, and they were assisted by a man wearing a hat. Alicia was a little surprised that this man was not a stranger to her, and the man seemed to recognize Alicia. His name was Cole, and they had once lived together in the stadium community established by Madison. When the stadium was overrun by zombies, Madison sacrificed herself to distract all the zombies, giving them a chance to escape. Neither had expected the other to still be alive. Seeing Cole, an old friend, brought Alicia some comfort. Cole expressed gratitude for Alicia's mother, saying, Thank goodness for your mom, or we would have all turned into zombies. Cole warned that their accident wasn't a coincidence and that there were dangerous people on that road. He offered to take them to a nearby auto parts store to find a tire. Out of respect for Alicia, on their way, Dakota curiously engaged in conversation with Teddy gradually realizing their ideologies were strikingly similar. She had killed many people, including John, and faced blame from the damn community, but didn't feel remorse. Seeing it as necessary, Teddy does understand Dakota very well. Cole suggested to Alicia that they could kill Teddy, but Alicia insisted it wasn't the time yet as they still needed to understand his grand plan. Arriving at the auto parts store, they indeed found tires. As Alicia was checking them, she noticed Teddy watching her, confused. She confronted him, and Teddy remarked, You really resemble my mother so much. Alicia was speechless at this comment. Just then, a lot of masked men with guns came through the door, and it turns out Cole was one of them. It was all a scheme. The assailants removed their masks. And to Alicia's shock, most were former residents of the stadium community. Alicia couldn't believe it. Teddy says her mother saved your lives. Cole coldly replied, So what? Maybe she should have let us die. In the last episode, Cole led Alicia and the others to an auto parts store to find a tire, only for it to be revealed as Cole's plot. Most of those now pointing guns at Alicia were people her mother, Madison, had once risked her life to save. After Madison's sacrifice, Cole and others faced the harsh reality outside and lost many companions, leading them to decide that becoming villains was the only way to survive. Surprisingly, their robbery target turned out to be Alicia. Back at the car, they plan to change the tire and take their supplies. Alicia is a little depressed at the moment, not realizing that after her mother saved them, they're doing something to hurt someone else. Teddy sees the opportunity to try and brainwash Alicia. He said her mother's sacrifice saved them, but most died, leaving only the despicable. He argued that the world needed destruction and rebirth because of people like Cole. Alicia wasn't stupid. She knew Teddy was trying to change her mind to make her feel like the world wasn't worth it so she could join them in destroying this filthy world. Alicia, hardened by her experiences in the apocalypse, 
was not easily swayed and rejected Teddy's manipulation again. Alicia simply asked, You know why I'm staying with you? Why don't you just tell me how you're going to destroy the world? Teddy replied that he would tell her when she was ready, once the tire was changed and it seemed they would leave with their supplies. Cole instead focused on extracting Teddy's base location. When threatened, Teddy calmly suggested they kill him, asserting that his unfinished work would be completed by others. Seeing Teddy unmoved, Cole thought of a plan involving Teddy's mother's body, throwing it to the ground and threatening to destroy it if Teddy didn't comply. The first shot hit the body's abdomen, but Teddy just calmly looked at Cole. The second shot aimed at the head. Yet Teddy remained unflustered. Even Dakota was puzzled. Teddy then revealed that the body wasn't his mother, leaving Alicia shocked by the deception. Teddy revealed the truth. His story about his mother's corpse was fabricated, and their arrival was no coincidence but a deliberate act. He knew about Cole's roadside robberies and had investigated the relationship between Cole and Alicia. He wanted to show Alicia the kind of people her mother had saved, aiming to provoke her into changing her mindset and joining them. At that moment, they were like fish on a chopping board. Teddy, unconcerned, reassured Alicia and Dakota, saying his plans would proceed regardless of whether they lived or died. Teddy was a complete madman, willing to destroy even himself for his ideology. Just as they raised their guns, there's the sound of zombies hissing in the woods, surely attracted by the gunfire. Cole tried to quickly kill Teddy and escape the zombies, but Alicia thwarted his attempt by lunging at his gun. The situation escalated as the zombies closed in, rendering the guns less effective. A man was tackled by zombies before he could fire a second shot, and his wife also became their prey. Within minutes, the group was decimated, leaving only Cole alive. Having just freed herself from a zombie that had pounced on her, Alicia approached while pushing another zombie ahead of her. They stood in confrontation. Alicia hesitated to push the zombies towards Cole. Cole was forced to deal with the zombie, losing his upper hand. Alicia aimed her gun at him, expressing her disappointment. She said her mother's sacrifice was meant to give him a second chance at life, which he had squandered. Cole looks at the hesitant Alicia and prepares to play the emotional card again, assuming she'll go soft. But he underestimated how much Alicia hates people like him. Not her mother didn't sacrifice herself to save Cole so he could be a villain. After dealing with Cole, Alicia turned to Teddy and declared, You're wrong, to create a better world. It's not about destroying everything, but about destroying people like them. Teddy just smiled contentedly. Dakota, seeing Alicia kill Cole, thought Alicia might now understand her. She likened Cole to John, but Alicia's still ignoring her. Dakota was conflating the issues. Alicia wants to be like her mother. Teddy appreciated Alicia's current state of mind, believing her thoughts had changed. However, Alicia made it clear she wouldn't follow him. The more she resisted, the happier Teddy became, saying her questioning reminded him of his mother. Did she think you're a nut job too? This revelation instantly darkened Teddy's expression. Teddy then confessed his background in mortuary science and his desire to change the world. He wrote a journal about why the world needed to be destroyed, which his mother found and considered him mentally unstable, threatening to have him committed, so he won't have these sick thoughts. In response, Teddy killed her and buried her in the backyard, further convinced of the need to evolve the world. When Alicia asked about his plan for the apocalypse, Teddy, believing her mindset had shifted, revealed that the key would launch a nuclear missile from a stranded submarine in Galveston, effectively destroying the world. Alicia takes a breath of air and takes the walkie-talkie from Teddy and says, it's not just people like Cole that need to be thrown away to make the world a better place. It's crazy people like you. Unexpectedly, Dakota pointed a gun at Alicia. Dakota found a kindred spirit in Teddy and wanted to follow him. Alicia picked up the walkie-talkie and called out for Morgan a couple of times but received no response. However, Victor's voice came through, asking, Alicia, are you okay? Anxiously, Alicia replied, you need to find Morgan and tell him what the key is for, that these maniacs are going to open the submarine on Galva's beach. Before she could finish, Jason snatched the walkie-talkie. Dakota assured them not to worry about Victor, believing he would flee first. Jason, frustrated with Alicia, was ready to kill her, but Teddy stopped him, considering Alicia special to him. Then, they arrived at a secluded hotel, where Alicia's hands were already bound. Teddy tells Alicia that an underground fortress was built here before the end of time. Surprisingly, no members of their organization were seen. Teddy, wanting privacy, left Dakota and another member outside, not wanting them to witness what was about to happen. Inside, 
Teddy hinted that Alicia was now to complete his mission, despite not knowing what it entailed. Alicia refused. They then proceeded to the basement, where Teddy opened the door to a bunker and locked Alicia inside. Teddy then spoke some bizarre words, I know this is hard, but you don't have a choice, you have to rebuild the world from here, my thoughts are too advanced for this world, I live in a world that doesn't belong to me, so I need to reshape it, this will soon happen to you too, good luck, Teddy's ideology was profoundly complex, almost incomprehensible, my understanding is that Teddy is about to destroy the world, including himself, however, the new world needs a leader, and he chose Alicia for this role because of her firm beliefs, her refusal to mindlessly kill the innocent, and her avoidance of excessive idealism. Let's go. Teddy, accompanied by Dakota, went to the nuclear submarine. Dakota questioned why Alicia was left alone in the bunker and what their final fate would be. Teddy explained that Alicia possessed unparalleled potential and was needed to lead in the reborn world. He told Dakota that they, being similar, would die here with everyone else, he asked her if she was willing to join him in this great mission or if she was willing to remain disguised in this false world, she can leave any time she wants, Dakota, feeling understood by Teddy, firmly decided to stand with him, at that moment, the submarine's lights came on and Jason switched on the backup power, Jason, a former weapons officer on the submarine, had fallen on hard times before meeting Teddy, there were two keys to launch the nuclear missiles, both hanging around Teddy's neck. The next step was to start the diesel generator to power the submarine and enable the launch. Morgan picked up his axe again after receiving Victor's notice. Everyone gathered at the submarine's location in armored vehicles and on horseback to stop Teddy's insane plan, believing the launch site would be safe as Teddy wouldn't kill his own people. Because he doesn't know the structure of the submarine, he can only open the top door by cutting. Inside was pitch black. Morgan dropped a flare and found it deeper than expected, and he chose to be the first to go down and investigate. Grace handed Morgan a radiation meter, warning that readings over 10,000 millirems required extreme caution. Meanwhile, Luciana and Wendell left to find a nearby naval base, hoping to procure the submarine's blueprints to avoid getting lost inside. Morgan descended, reporting radiation levels to Grace. Despite the numbers continuously rising, he consistently reported that the radiation level was only at 10 millirems. Morgan quickly reached the bottom of the submarine, where a zombie suddenly lunged at him, causing panic among those above. Pinned down by the zombie, Morgan struggled. Dory, with poor vision due to age, couldn't see what was happening. In the nick of time, Naomi decisively shot and fortunately hit the zombie, relieving everyone. It seemed the submarine crew had died and turned into zombies. Grace asked for the radiation readings again, and Morgan repeated that it was 10 millirems. Grace, suspecting Morgan was hiding the truth, decided to go down to help him. After arriving, Grace checked the meter and confirmed the radiation levels were safe, signaling the others to come down. Meanwhile, Luciana informed Sherry they had reached the naval base and found the submarine's blueprints. Shortly, others reached the bottom, observing their surroundings. They realized Teddy and his group must be in another part of the submarine. The primary concern now was the number of zombies inside. Sherry contacted Luciana to ask about the typical crew size of a submarine, but the deeper they went, the more interference they encountered. The rest of the team continues forward to see what's going on. Grace stayed near the exit to maintain contact with Luciana until she climbed up to a higher level where the walkie-talkie finally worked. Luciana reported there were 150 crew members, since Morgan and the others weren't far away. They heard it too. Hearing this, Morgan and the group were in disbelief, realizing there could be 149 zombies. A massive undertaking. Morgan tapped on a hatch with his knife, and zombies inside responded. Grace asked what was behind the door. Luciana said it was the missile bay, a corridor leading to the launch wells and the most direct route to the weapons room. If Teddy planned to launch the nukes, he would be in the control room, accessible only through this passage. With no other choice, they prepared to enter through this route. Morgan opened the hatch, and immediately, the growls of zombies filled the air. He charged ahead, surprisingly finding fewer zombies than expected. Morgan led the way through the narrow corridor, with the others supporting from behind. In just two minutes, he cleared out seven or eight zombies. Checking his counter, the radiation was around 240, a safe level. 
The group entered the missile bay and observed a stack of missiles capable of destroying a continent. Naomi suggested dismantling them, but the idea was dismissed due to the risk and lack of expertise. The best course of action was to head to the weapons room to stop the launch. Morgan then alerted everyone to listen carefully to the numerous growls of zombies, indicating that the majority were not in this section of the submarine. Suddenly, Grace's voice came through the walkie-talkie next to Morgan. Originally, Grace was just trying it out, assuming it to be the submarine's internal communication system that didn't require an external power source. Morgan asked Grace to contact Luciana to find a route to the weapons control room from the blueprints. Before Grace could respond, Teddy's voice came through, taunting Morgan, not believing they could stop him. Dory took the walkie-talkie, and Teddy's tone changed, recognizing the man who had put him in jail for nearly 30 years. Dory asked about Alicia's whereabouts. Teddy smugly replied she was safer than all of them, hidden somewhere they'd never find. Morgan, holding the walkie-talkie, asked Teddy, tell us where the missiles are targeted. Teddy mockingly questioned if they thought the submarine was safe. Realizing Teddy's madness, Morgan urgently instructed Grace to tell Luciana to move everyone from the dam as far away from the submarine as possible. Jason informed Teddy that preparations were almost complete. Teddy scorned Morgan again, announcing they were about to power up the submarine. With time running out, they split up to find the hatch leading to the weapon control room. <laughs> Sherry and the others saw a strange sight. Some of the crew were dead in their own beds. It looked like they had chosen to kill themselves because they didn't want to turn into zombies. Morgan, distancing himself from the group, found the hatch to the weapons room and decided to proceed alone, not wanting to risk others' lives. Upon opening the hatch, he looked back at the group's direction, entered, and quickly closed the door, not wanting to alert anyone. However, Victor found him and pulled the door open just as Morgan was closing it. Morgan tried to argue but two zombies were already behind Victor and Morgan had no choice but to let him in and quickly close the hatch. Morgan expressed his reluctance to involve others, feeling he always led people from one dire situation to another, he preferred to handle this alone. Victor reassures him that people follow you because they want to, not because you owe them anything. Morgan is actually puzzled by the fact that Victor is being unusually proactive this time around, which is not in his character. Victor just said, I want to do something for everyone, and I want to prove myself to Alicia. Their radiation meter started buzzing alarmingly, indicating high radiation levels, with readings skyrocketing. Ahead, they heard zombies. They encountered a pus-covered zombie that collapsed after a few steps. Morgan stopped Victor from using a knife. Knowing the risks with radiation-infected zombies, the meter's readings soared above 10,000 when near the corpse. Morgan cautiously moved forward hearing zombies growls from behind the hatch. As they neared the hatch, the radiation levels soared to a terrifying 40,000 millirems, but it remained the quickest route to the weapons room. Suddenly, the sound of machinery echoed inside the submarine, likely the diesel generator starting up, signaling that power was about to be restored. Their time was running short. Morgan contacted Grace using the wall intercom and informed her about the high radiation levels. Grace warned that if the radiation outside the door was 40,000, it would be even higher inside, likely due to a radiation material leak, and advised Morgan to find another way. The submarine's lights came on, indicating Teddy had powered it up. Morgan, facing the door, asked how long he could survive if he went inside. Grace said she didn't know, but it wouldn't be more than three days. Morgan, desperate, decided to proceed, ignoring the immediate risk of death, leaving Grace anxiously calling out from outside. Victor discovered an overhead compartment with zombies moving around and a staircase with zombies occasionally falling down. Morgan, unable to wait, was ready to charge in and kill the zombies inside, but Victor stopped him, suggesting another route above them. After climbing up, they found a handcuffed corpse and then reached a corridor blocked with numerous zombies, likely trapped by the actions of the handcuffed corpse just before dying. Thankfully, the route to the weapon room was in another direction. The two of them turned around and walked towards the back where there were also corpses, and there was indeed a passageway. Before they were glad that zombies started to come out of the hatch, it seemed that this way was not easy to go either. Forced to flee to the bunk room for another exit, they found it a dead end. Zombies from both directions in the corridor started to close in on them. Morgan regretted not entering the first door. Victor says that's why Alicia came to you instead of me. Morgan was puzzled. Victor revealed that Alicia's last message wasn't for him but for Morgan, acknowledging Morgan's willingness to do what others wouldn't. Morgan doesn't know what Victor's talking about right now. Victor's next action surprised Morgan, due to the extremely tight space. Morgan was quickly pinned to the ground by Victor, 
who then stood over him and grabbed Morgan's weapon. In the ensuing struggle, the axe was split in two. Victor declared that if Morgan didn't want anyone to die, he should be the one to die and kicked him into the zombie crowd. Then, Victor, seizing the moment as the zombies were distracted by Morgan, ran towards the passage. The selfish and self-serving Victor had returned. Victor aimed to stop Teddy, intending to become a great hero and earn Alicia's admiration and respect. When he reached the weapon room's door, he heard the sound of a gun being cocked. Dakota pointed a gun at him. Victor had no choice but to drop the axe and try to appeal to Dakota's emotions. Dakota, now a firm believer in Teddy's ideology, no longer hid her true self. She has just seen Victor's behavior, and Dakota thinks that Victor is a hypocrite. Over the intercom, Dakota announced that she was being her true self and claimed that Morgan's approach would never work, falsely stating that Victor had killed him. Upon hearing this, Grace felt a pang of pain. Dakota continued, condemning the world for having hypocrites like Victor and stated that such people wouldn't exist in the new world after its destruction. Victor realized Dakota was resolved to kill him. Tears of sorrow or regret in his eyes. Oh! Then, Morgan arrived. Dakota tried to resist with the axe, but she was no match for him. Morgan, without blaming Victor, first informed Grace over the intercom that he was alive. Victor tried to speak, but Morgan handed him the axe, saying they would deal with his actions later. They had wasted too much time already. Inside the weapon room, Jason had made all the preparations. Teddy called for Dakota, but there was no response. The door's lights came on, indicating someone was trying to unlock it. When Morgan arrived, he collected the identity cards of the officers from the bunk room. Since the weapon room's door required an authorized access card to open, they had no choice but to try each card one by one. Aware that time was of the essence, Teddy took out two keys. Knowing that the nuclear weapon could only be unlocked if both keys were turned simultaneously, they agreed to count to one and activate it at the same time. Meanwhile, Morgan was trying card after card with no access granted, down to the last one in his hand. Inside, Jason began the countdown. At 3, 2, 1, they turned their keys at the same moment. Finally, Morgan's last card succeeded in opening the weapon room's door. Seeing the door open, Teddy hurriedly pulled a switch. By the time Morgan and Victor entered, the submarine had already begun to tremble. Morgan shouted for them to stop. At this moment, Teddy genuinely feared that Morgan might stab him to death, muttering that it was already too late. The entire submarine started shaking, indicating the missile had been launched. Realizing this, everyone else on the submarine knew their only option was to escape quickly. Grace, however, determinately stayed behind, waiting for Morgan. Outside, a loud explosion was heard, accompanied by a lot of white smoke as a huge missile emerged and slowly ascended into the sky under the gaze of those outside. It was a shocking sight, possibly the last of its kind they would ever see. The missile rose higher, breaking through the clouds. The submarine then returned to calm. Morgan, at this point, seemed lost in thought. Jason, looking at the weapon switch, attempted to launch a second missile, but Victor stopped him. Teddy reassured that one was enough to start anew. Victor asked where the missile was targeted. Jason revealed that the missile had 10 warheads that would land randomly in different locations. Realizing the situation was beyond repair, Morgan let go of Teddy and allowed Victor to release Jason. They then left the area. There's no point in killing them now. There's a chance that everyone won't survive anyway. Morgan urged Victor to leave. As staying was futile, he wanted to stay behind to see if he could alter the missile's trajectory. Surviving the apocalypse as a single mother is incredibly tough. For Rachel, something as simple as a flat tire posed a significant obstacle, especially with her child crying continuously in the car. Despite the helplessness that filled her life, years of survival in the apocalypse had made her strong. She picked up a walkie-talkie, calling out in hopes someone would help. Suddenly, a loud sound from the sky signaled a missile breaking through the atmosphere. Rachel's mind had a few guesses. Morgan's voice then came through the walkie-talkie, apologizing and saying they had tried their best. He was still on the submarine, attempting to change the missile's trajectory but uncertain of success. He warned that the nuclear missile, carrying 10 warheads, would re-enter the atmosphere, and these could be their last moments. He urged everyone to make the most of this time and choose their desired ending. Rachel felt a wave of sadness but, looking at her child, refused to give up. Even without knowing how to escape the looming threat, Rachel pushed harder and harder to get the tire off. The only person she could rely on now was herself. In a forceful pull, the jack slipped, 
causing the tire to crash down on her leg. She screamed in pain for five minutes, realizing her leg was severely broken, even losing sensation in her lower leg. Life seemed overwhelmingly difficult. Most people might have given up, but hearing her daughter's cries, Rachel knew she had to keep going, holding onto any sliver of hope. Unable to stand, she reached for some wooden tape to makeshift a splint for her broken leg. Enduring the immense pain without shedding a tear, she picked up her backpack and her child. Knowing she couldn't afford to give up yet, hobbling forward, Rachel moved slowly, hoping her dog would lead her to others, but her leg injury was too severe. <laughs> Struggling to stand again, Rachel faced the endless road ahead and wondered if she could really make it. Then, another explosion sounded in the sky as the missile released its warheads. Rachel, holding back tears while looking at her daughter's innocent face, felt utterly helpless. Then she made a decision. She used the knife in her hand to untie the bag behind her and put little Morgan on her back. She told her daughter, this is my end, but not yours. Rachel then took out a rope from her backpack, tying one end around her waist and the other to her dog. She begged the dog, you're good at finding people, promise me you'll find someone to help. She then tied a scarf into a rope around her mouth, tightening it with all her might. Her eyes filled with reluctance, her eyes were full of sadness she once again said to her daughter I'm sorry, I love you, and then she picked up the knife and fed it into her body. Life is full of people who want to live, but Rachel only wanted to die. This is the only way to give her daughter a chance of survival. Since the missile launch, everyone who saw it knew they had little time left. Luciana and her group returned to the naval base, having previously discovered a basement there. Meanwhile, Daniel, on the armored vehicle, had written down coordinates he heard over the radio, suggesting a possible escape. When he tried to listen again, he only found Morgan's final message to everyone. At that moment, Luciana and her group reached the vehicle and upon inspecting the basement, found it was almost entirely filled with zombies. Realizing that staying there would be a waste of time, they decided to move on. At that moment, a car approached from a distance. It was Wes and Raleigh, bringing Jason with them. Raleigh suggested they could go to a bunker, where Alicia was also being held. Explaining they captured Jason, who divulged the location, Charlie was surprised that Jason so readily shared the address. Raleigh explained that Teddy had abandoned Jason, and he had ways to make him talk. Daniel, distrustful of Jason, recounted hearing a different set of coordinates on the radio, believed to be safe. When asked who was broadcasting, Daniel couldn't recall the voice. Raleigh mockingly suggested Daniel might be hallucinating again, causing Daniel to doubt his own certainty. Was it just his imagination? With no other choice, they decided to trust Jason's information and head to the bunker to avoid the catastrophe. They didn't avoid zombies on the road anymore, crushing them as they went. Daniel taunted Jason, asking why he was revealing the bunker's location at the end of everything and why he was silent now. Was he no longer willing to sacrifice for his grand cause? Just then, the vehicle stopped abruptly due to a brake system malfunction. Sarah had to get out to fix the car, with a few zombies lurking nearby. Those capable of fighting in the vehicle stepped out to clear the zombies while Sarah set up for welding. Daniel, with his assassin's instincts, felt Jason was hiding something. He confronted Jason, asking why he didn't want to die for his cause. Jason, no longer silent, cryptically mentioned the Phoenix's rebirth, indicating their belief in a destructive yet renewing cycle. Daniel stopped talking to him and came out to check on the progress of the repairs. Sarah managed to fix the damaged part urging everyone to get back into the vehicle quickly. Raleigh said, we'll get out of here like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Hearing this, Daniel was not calm. He quietly said to Luciana, give me the gun. Luciana doesn't know what's going on. Daniel says, do you think the oil traders deserve to die? And then he shoots Raleigh. The people inside the car were shocked, fearing Daniel was having another episode. Daniel explained that Raleigh was an enemy accomplice and had no intention of going to the bunker which is why they were ambushed at the naval base. At that moment, Charlie shot Jason, who was about to attack Daniel. Jason, knowing his end was near, admitted his alliance with Raleigh. At this time, there was another explosion in the sky. One of the warheads has separated. It's only a matter of time before it reaches the ground. Faced with no other choice, they decided to trust the coordinates Daniel had heard on the radio. It's not too late to get there. The car traveled for some time before finally arriving at the place indicated by the landmark. But there was nothing here. Is it really Daniel's hallucination? Daniel starts apologizing to everyone, regretting that he's put them in danger again. Inside the car, Jason begins mocking, 
infuriating Daniel who ends up leaving him stranded on the road. Just then, Charlie seems to spot something. A helicopter flies in from a distance, perhaps their glimmer of hope. They quickly head towards it. Wes was spray painting something on the ground. As the helicopter lands, Sarah urgently asks the pilot who they are. Over the radio, a voice expresses relief at their discovery of the coordinates, explaining they wanted to pick them up personally but ran out of fuel. The voice belongs to Althea, who's been missing for a long time. Althea instructs them not to ask the pilot any questions, emphasizing that the less they know, the better. It's a wonderful feeling to be alive after all this. Wes leaves a message on the ground. This is not the end. The helicopter took them off the land. Will the others be as lucky? A nuclear missile soars into the sky, threatening to obliterate the continent upon its descent. Dwight and Sherry scour for a sturdy building, hoping to survive the impending doom. Even if they are destroyed, they will hold each other's hands. Dwight gazes around in confusion. The map showed a school here. But now, there's not even a shelter in sight. With no time for regret, they continue along the road, only to find a flimsy house incapable of withstanding the blast wave. But Sherry, half in jest, suggests they might find beer and burritos inside, the simple pleasures they'd promised to share once reunited. But due to her reasons, it had never been realized. If the nuclear bomb really destroys everything, this will become an eternal regret. They enter the eerily quiet, tidy, but deserted house. After a thorough search, they reunite outside, no burritos, but two cans of beer, a small consolation. Sherry feels a sense of loss after seeing a family portrait inside the house. She said why didn't we start a family like this earlier? You finally found me after so much effort, yet I wasted time dwelling on hatred for the past, consumed by anger and chasing down villains, but it seems the villains always win. We've witnessed it time and again. How much time that could have been spent with you did I waste? Dwight has always loved and accepted her unconditionally, never complaining about her struggles. Don't apologize for anything you've done, Dwight tells her. Just then a woman came out of the house and on the other side a man with a stick came out. Dwight quickly explains they meant no trouble and thought the house was abandoned. This eases the tension a bit. Sherry warns them about the imminent nuclear explosion and advises them to leave if they have a place to hide. Kevin responds, we had a cellar. We were about to take shelter there after seeing the missile. But those bastards showed up and kicked us out. They kept saying, the end is the beginning, even pointing a gun at my child's face. No doubt, they are Teddy's men. Dwight didn't leave just asked where their cellar was and he was going to grab it back and give it back to the Kevins. He tied one end of a rope around the cellar door, the other end to a horse, and then forcefully slapped the horse's back. Immediately, he and Sherry took cover behind the cellar. The door flew off as a man with a gun emerged, firing wildly. Before he could see his attacker, Sherry shot him dead. Another man, not fatally hit, struggled to flee but Dwight accurately shot his right leg. The man growls, shoot me, I won't kill you, Dwight said. Enjoy the nuclear bomb you launched. Sherry emotionlessly shot the man's left leg. Kevin urged them to take cover in the cellar. As they saw the nuclear warhead splitting in the sky, they quickly ran into the cellar and secured the lid. Meanwhile, Teddy and Dakota were also fleeing. Actually, Dakota is a child desperately lacking love and naturally thought she had found a kindred spirit in Teddy. Teddy led Dakota to a hilltop, a perfect spot to watch the world's destruction. Dakota gratefully said, You said I'm different, and you're the only one who truly understands me. You're the first not to think I'm crazy and didn't try to change me. Just then, Dory arrived with a gun. Coming up behind them, Teddy thought Dory tracked him to kill him. Dory said to Dakota, I came for you, but not to harm you. I just want to talk and hope you'll listen. Dakota, holding her gun, thought Dory came for revenge for his son. Dory said, I forgive you for killing John, and placed his handgun on the ground. As Dakota seemed to lose control, Teddy drew his gun, ready to kill Dory. The person who arrived was Naomi. Dakota immediately became tense. Naomi said, I forgive you too. John would have wanted us to. Don't be misled by this old man anymore. Then Dory opened a hatch. He also told Dakota, you think he really wants to end it all? He's planning to start anew in this cellar. Saying the end is the beginning is just a way to manipulate people. He's not with you because he understands you, but because launching the nuke requires two people to turn the keys. Dakota looked at Teddy incredulously, but still pointed the gun at Dory, realizing Dakota was beyond persuasion.
They coordinated with each other and prepared to take shelter in the cellar. When Naomi invited Dakota again, she chose to stay above and witness the end. Naomi had no choice but to go along with it. As the cellar door closed, Dakota pointed the gun at Teddy, doubting him after Dory's words. Teddy tried to brainwash her again. But Dakota, standing over his body, said, You told me never to change. I never did. Victor, riding through the city on horseback, didn't know where was safe. Passing a house, he felt it might be a sanctuary but found it full of zombies. He rushed in, killing an attacking zombie, and made his way to the second floor. The place was empty except for corpses. Victor looked at the countless zombies downstairs. He originally thought that this was a place where he could survive. But he never thought that he would walk into a dead end. <coughs> Despairingly sitting down, tears flowed again. He decided to check upstairs and found it full of supplies. A man, Howard, approached and they talked. Victor asked if there was a place to hide from the nuke. Howard said no, resigned to their fate. They decided to enjoy their last moments. Victor introduced himself, saying his name was Morgan Jones. He originally tried to stop the nuclear bomb with someone else, but one of them abandoned the other for their own survival and glory. Howard asked which one he was. Victor replied, the one who was abandoned. Howard couldn't help but look at him with admiration. Grace, heartbroken, lies on the submarine, the death of her daughter draining her of all motivation. Morgan's voice suddenly comes through the walkie-talkie, urging everyone to cherish their last moments. Grace broke down. Why does fate always play such cruel tricks on people? Eventually calming down, she decides to find Morgan, the man who has always silently supported her. Many viewers joked about the nuclear bomb waiting for a traffic light, wondering why it's taking so long to land. This needs clarification the bomb has to enter the atmosphere and then separate its warhead. The escape sequences are happening simultaneously. Morgan is in the control room, desperately trying to change the missile's trajectory, though he knows it's futile. Comforted by Grace, he slowly calms down, his desire to save everyone overwhelming him. We don't know where these warheads will land, but they'll be close, Grace says. Even if we survive the blast, the air will be filled with radiation. I don't want to live in such a world. The radiation this time will be even worse. She recalls watching Athena's father die painfully from radiation, unwilling to see her loved one suffer the same fate. Morgan, understanding her pain, gathers the courage to kiss Grace for the first time, confessing his love. Then Grace pulls out a handgun, asking Morgan to end her life. Morgan laments about wanting to take care of her, to create a stable home for Athena, but fate played a cruel joke on them. Morgan chose to die with Grace. As Morgan is about to pull the trigger, Grace says she hears Athena's voice calling her. Initially thinking it's a heavenly voice, they realize it's real a child's cry, confirming it's not a hallucination. They go outside the submarine and hear a dog barking. Behind the dog was Rachel, who had turned into a zombie. Accompanied by little Morgan's cries, they sadly witness the scene, Morgan wondering how to interpret this kind of maternal love, realizing what happened from Rachel's horrific broken leg. Morgan mercifully ends Rachel's suffering and gently picks up little Morgan, trying to calm her. Perhaps this was destiny's best arrangement. Like a gift from the goddess Athena, Grace is unsure how to face the child. She wants to see and hold little Morgan but can't bring herself to do it. A feeling perhaps understandable to a mother, Victor watches a missile fall straight down from the sky through the window, with nothing to do but wait for death's verdict. Meanwhile, Dakota isn't so lucky, too close to the explosion site. She turns to ash before the shockwave hits. Even Naomi in the cellar feels the fierce impact. Fortunately without a collapse, the cottage is instantly destroyed. Dwight quickly protects Sherry, and Kevin's family huddles together. As the shaking subsides, they realize they've survived. Sherry breaking down in tears. Next to the submarine, Grace was dumbfounded as the shockwave swept towards the sea and they had no choice but to run away. A nearby truck becomes their last hope, the dog also taking refuge inside. As the shockwave just reached the submarine, they took the child and hid under a truck, which was then engulfed in dust. Only by experiencing it can one understand how terrifying it is. The truck shook violently, as if ready to take flight. Victor also felt the tremors of the shockwave, his emotions like a roller coaster ride. When everything calmed down, both were somewhat in disbelief that they were unharmed. Victor was extremely lucky, the building was far enough from the blast site to survive. Victor burst into laughter, acknowledging he's not a hero but a villain, with no one more eager to survive than him. 
This is definitely something to celebrate. Victor revealed to Howard. I'm not the one who was abandoned. I'm the other one. My name isn't Morgan Jones. It's Victor Strand. I'm someone who throws others to the wolves when necessary and never regrets my actions. I'm a businessman. A con man. A swindler. And I cheat at chess. Time and time again. And I never miss. Howard asked why he did this. And Victor answered. For survival. My entire life has been about surviving. I started from nothing and know how to keep living. That's who I am. And I can never change. Victor is perhaps the most real character in the series. He plans to use the explosion and the resources here to build a new era. Morgan and Grace also survived. Before they could rejoice, more sounds of warhead explosions came from the sky. The power of just one warhead was immense. It's hard to imagine what the remaining nine will do to this land. This marks the end of the sixth season of Fear the Walking Dead. Thank you for your support. And see you next season. Thank you again.